Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is February 9th, 2022, and uh, we have a special Mormon Stories episode for you today. Today, we have with us uh, two gentlemen that I've known for quite some time. One is returning to Mormon Stories Podcast. We have uh, Carl Youngblood, who's returning to Mormon Stories. Hey, Carl. Hi. Hi. Good to be here. And Lincoln Cannon, who uh, who I met many years ago, but is joining us for the first time. Welcome, Lincoln. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, just to give a tiny bit of an introduction. So probably 2004, 2005, I'm just moved to Utah. I am just trying to get to know people in Utah and Mormons and and the like. I'm I'm uh, you know connecting with Sunstone and Dan Witherspoon and just trying to get a lay of the land. I'm invited to some house uh, with a bunch of young people, younger than me, and it was part of a internet group called SWAB or Spock with a Beard. It was an acronym for Spock with a Beard. And I meet, uh, you know, these people that are all kind of young, fun people, kind of progressive Mormon types. And they've got this group. This is pre-Facebook. This is pre, you know, probably pre-YouTube. And they're just all forging this really lovely community of really thoughtful young people who like to have intellectual discussions. And um, over time, like all the internet uh, forums of the day, they've kind of all passed away or gone away. I don't know what the status of Swab is. But uh, as Swab kind of started declining, some of these friends in this group uh, started more and more talking about something called transhumanism, uh, which is what the topic of today's uh, Mormon Stories episode is going to be about. But uh, those of you who happen to have caught Carl Youngblood's episode uh, on Mormon Stories a couple years ago, Carl would have given a bit of an introduction to, uh, to transhumanism there. But because, uh, because I felt like I was really interested in talking to Carl about his Mormonism, about his progressive Mormonism, about how he still believes in Mormonism, you know, in spite of the challenges to its historicity and its truth claims, et cetera. I think, I think maybe our conversation about transhumanism got a tiny bit derailed in that. Um, but also I've just enjoyed keeping up with Carl and I've always wanted to have Lincoln on, but then if I could also just add one extra layer on Mormon Stories podcast, you know, one of the reasons I wear this Thrive hat, it's not an MLM, it's not a, a for-profit venture. It's literally just this idea that, you know, you can um, you can thrive, you can uh, do well, uh, even if you're not a normal Mormon and an average everyday Orthodox conservative Mormon, you can still find healing and growth in community, either as a progressive Mormon or um, as an inactive Mormon, or even if you've left the church. But the whole idea behind Thrive and this new Thrive initiative that we have going with Margie, where um, we're going to be bringing people on to Mormon Stories podcast to tell their stories of how they've thrived sort of outside of Mormon orthodoxy, we'll say. This is going to be kind of a pre-interview in that spirit. And the reason why we're not just having Margie here to do a regular Thrive story, which is what you're going to be seeing in the future, is because in this case, Lincoln and Carl still are active. And I would probably, I'm guessing they would identify as faithful Mormons. So it doesn't quite fit uh, the, the Thrive story model. But, 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 but is that true? Both of you guys attend the church yeah. and identify as active faithful Mormons, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. In fact, if I could just take a moment, like I think... Our last discussion that we had, which I was really grateful for the opportunity, um, a number of folks, I think, came back to both you and me and said, like, you guys spent so long on this one little part of it. And all I, I, I kind of feel like I didn't have the presence of mind in some cases to, like, respond adequately. But I think the biggest thing, I, the, the sort of takeaway from that conversation that I was left with is I totally should have done a better job of acknowledging the... Um, you know, the fact that my Mormonism is not necessarily like perhaps the most common. The main point I wanted to make was just that I still see it as legitimate, if that makes sense. Totally. So like I, if you wanted to claim mine was a little more rare or unusual, I, that's fine. That's, that's fair. That's totally fair. 
I still see it as authentic, if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. And the truth is there's 6 million <clears throat> versions of Mormonism out there because there's yeah, 16, yeah. 16 plus million Mormons. So there's 16 plus million versions of Mormonism. So or, I've saved you like yeah. four hours of that episode <laughs> by just saying that. So, I mean, I if you want, you go ahead and watch it again. But <laughs> Well, I and, and by the way, for a long time, the traditional Mormon stories was always having people from across the faith and belief spectrum. Once I got excommunicated, less and less believers were willing to come on the show. And in some way that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where like people will peg you as an anti or an ex-Mormon podcast because faithful people won't engage anymore because they're afraid of what might happen if they do engage. So in that spirit, I'm number one, grateful that you would come on Mormon Stories podcast as faithful believing members. Um, and also that you, you know, would would uh, be willing to share you know, what, what do you think and feel? Because it's just always been in the spirit of, of Mormon stories to, to have people like you on. So in that sense, thank you so much for being willing to brave whatever disciplinary action <laughs> might, you know, potentially you might be at risk for, which is probably none. But, probably none. But but I, I feel pretty good you. about it, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'm, thank, I'm thankful for the opportunity. It's, an, it's nice of you to invite. Uh, my pleasure. So just to kind of finish the thought, I love sharing on Mormon Stories podcast anything that helps people find community, anything that gives people a sense of identity or meaning or purpose, whether they're in or out of the church. If it's not just regular vanilla flavored Orthodox Mormonism, it has a place on Mormon Stories. And what I do know for sure is that there are many super bright, thoughtful people that have taken to transhumanism and Mormon transhumanism. Uh, and you guys have had this conference that you hold every year where people like Rosalind Welch and Richard Bushman and other super smart people have spoken at, uh, I want to say Adam Miller, yeah. you know, a lot of the people that we've had on Mormon stories podcast in the past, a lot of people that our listeners either used to respect or even still respect today have, have been guests to your conference. This isn't kind of necessarily kooky, nerdy fringe people. These are super smart, capable, accomplished professionals and lots of other types of people who have found uh, meaning or value or purpose or community or solace in the philosophy of transhumanism. I know transhumanism is a much broader movement than just Mormonism or post-Mormonism. Right. I'm also guessing there are post-Mormons in your yeah. Mormon mm -hmm. transhumanism movement. And so what today is all about is introducing transhumanism to you, to you, my listeners and viewers, our listener and viewers, to let you know what it is, why it might be interesting or important or valuable, and to just share it with everyone as an option for people to add, whether they're in or out of the church, regardless of your belief perspective, perspective it just might be something that could enhance your life. And that, that sort of corresponds with the whole Thrive initiative and that's why we're having you guys on. And um, before I just throw it to you guys, I also want to introduce my cherished and valuable um, side host okay. and partner in righteousness and goodness, Kara Burrell. Kara. Hey, hey, fellas. You made it. Hey. Yeah. Uh, John had a busy morning. <laughs> and I went from, he went from one live stream to popping into this. I walked in, met the guys in the hallway, said, we're doing a podcast right now. Let's get on it. <laughs> Well, Kara, as, as my listeners and viewers know, you've added so much to, we just passed 50,000 subscribers on YouTube today during Congrats. our live stream. Yeah, congratulations. And, uh, you know, for some that's nothing for some, that's if big. it's not under, you know, millions, it's irrelevant in the Mormon world. That's big. There aren't a lot of Mormon themed YouTube channels that have over 50,000 subscribers. And with your long form content, I'd say that's quite an accomplishment as well. You know, yeah. not everyone you know, listens to the longer YouTube no. videos. So that's a lot. I'll yeah. be sending Brad Wilcox a basket of muffins. <laughs> <laughs> he helped push us over the top. Oh yeah. Um, the more the church <laughs> does things, the more we have to report on it, the more we report on it, the more <clears throat> subscribers we get. It's just evidence of the problem that is evident, <laughs> you know. Well, we're all trying to do better, we're right? Yeah, that's part better. of what transhumanism is about. It's about yes. progress. So Well, in a lot of ways, I also um, look forward in some, in a weird way to challenges that the church faces um, in various ways, because I feel like it maybe helps um, some of the the perspectives that we would like to share, you know, get a little more airtime or attention. Um, I also feel like uh, there are things that need to be improved and, and fixed and stuff. And so 
anything that brings that to light that kind of helps truth to come forth, I think is yeah. welcome. Challenges are always opportunities to improve. Yeah. They always are. Now, whether we do it or not is another thing, but totally. All right. Well, Kara, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us as always. Yeah. You're a really important part of our success. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what I want to do is start with the ending. What is transhumanism in like a couple minutes? And then we're going to go into a little bit about both of your stories and then how you came into transhumanism and maybe how you came to kind of create the tran Mormon transhumanism movement. And then we'll just get into just a deep dive, not a deep dive, but an initial dive into what it is, why it's interesting, why it's important, why it's relevant, why so many cool, smart, thoughtful people in and out of Mormonism care about it. But but let's maybe start with you. Now, Lincoln, you've been the president of the Mormon Transhumanism Association yeah, in the I past. Yeah, I was the president for the are. first 10 years. For the first 10 years. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we'll start with you, Lincoln. Sure. If you had to give an introduction to transhumanism in a way that would pique people's interest to make them feel like it could be interesting or relevant to them, what, what, how would you describe it? And then, mm -hmm. and then Carl will have you add to what Lincoln says. Sure. Yeah. So my definition of transhumanism is the, is advocacy for the ethical use of technology to enhance human abilities. And I'd emphasize a couple of the words there. One would be advocacy and the other would be ethics. It's not just technology cheerleading. Um, so ethics matters. It's people who recognize both the opportunities and the risks of emerging technology uh, for humanity and for our ongoing evolution. And then advocacy is important because it's not just about people recognizing risks and opportunities, but actually saying, hey, there are these risks and opportunities. Let's go do something about that. Okay. So it's kind of like a heavy tech focus of what the risks and potentials of technology can be and saying, we've all got free time. Let's spend our free time learning about tech and its dangers and uses and how it could enhance humankind. Is that Learning is a good start, but we also encourage people and you know, that includes ourselves to do more than just learn about these things. How can we actually practice these things in ways that make our bodies and our brains, our communities and our world better than they were historically? Ooh. What can we actually do, not just to be talkers, but doers? So rituals almost. Sure. And I would even add that, like, it's not just a matter of what we're doing with our free time. It also has a lot to do with what we're even doing with our day-to-day -day work. I mean... A lot of the people who are just working at a startup or working at any company, more and more, these questions about technology and which direction to take things, how to develop certain plans and ideas involve serious, you know, cutting edge technologies. And the, the choices you make about which direction you want to take things in your business could have a lot to do with the outcomes for society and for individuals. I mean, Right now, we're seeing social media companies, for example, making choices about the ways that we will be interacting with each other that could have huge implications for the, the whole nature of our existence, right? Yeah. You guys, in, in your outline, you listed like a bunch of the technologies that, that probably are some of the most common uh, things to talk about amongst transhumanists. But go ahead and just rifle off some of the technologies that you guys would give us examples of technologies that really have the potential to affect the, the health and the well-being of humankind and the world. Well, one I would jump off that's kind of on people's minds lately. We're is, not going to dive into them yet. Just, sure, list, just yeah. like, yeah. Is um, virtual reality, right? A lot of folks are right meta, now. The meta. Yeah, I mean, that's on people's yeah. minds because Facebook recently announced, well, they, they changed their name to Meta. <laughs> and they announced that kind of this is the place where people are going to be conducting business and maybe even just social activities in the future. That's where they are saying we're all going to be. That seems like a radical shift in the way we currently interact. So I don't know. So the metaverse, what's add? one? Yeah, you know, biotechnology, genetics, CRISPR. Cris CRISPR technology. Um, nanotechnology and its future uh, for molecular machines, potentially. There are cognitive uh, technologies, uh, brain-computer interfacing, brain emulation technologies. All of these have... Uh, huge narratives developed around them in the transhumanist movement. I would add energy, um, new forms of energy Solar. extraction, like oh. renewable energy, but also one th area that's heating up right now in just the next, the last little while is um, fusion energy. 
a number of companies have announced they're only a couple years, two or three years away from viable fusion, which up That's until a sensitive recently, topic in Utah, right? With yeah, cold, cold, cold fusion. fusion and that whole de debacle. <laughs> I think only people like our age actually remember that story. But are you like, saying I'm old? What do you say, Carl? What are you saying? I'm old. our age. <laughs> Carrie, have you ever heard of cold fusion? No. No? Okay. Pons, right? Wasn't it Pons and Fleshman or something yeah, yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah. It was a big scandal. Some <clears throat> University of Utah, was he a professor? professor or something like claimed that. Claimed to have figured out how to fuse, how to extract energy from the fusion of molecules, but really hadn't figured it out. But everyone thought that he had, and it was a huge academic scandal in the mm -hmm. early 90s. So mm -hmm. you're welcome. for. So never <laughs> trust scientists again. Exactly. Great. That's yeah. our point. Is don't trust scientists. Okay, keep going. I think that's yeah, the Yeah, I mean, point so too. I just mentioned that because, you know, up until recently, fusion energy, like pragmatic, practical fusion had always been 20 years away. Everybody kept saying it's just an, another 20 years and we'll have this figured out. And they've been saying that for like 50 years now. And But now there's a few companies that are really saying they're super close. And the amazing thing that that would be is like it would actually provide us with practically free energy all across the globe. Mm. I mean, just imagine what that would be like, you know. So. Okay. Another important thing to recognize about transhumanism is that it's not only about technology either. Some transhumanists like to point out that there's two important ways to approach the word. There's trans-humanism and transhuman-ism. Um Transhuman-ism would be about the application of technology to the human condition. How do we change our brains and bodies to be better? But there's also the trans-humanism. And so there's this idea about what is humanism in the first place. It's, oh, it's, wow. a, it's an ancient yeah. uh, philosophy yeah. and ideology with, with a rich, rich um, set of ideas that inform many people in the world. One of the important aspects of transhumanism is the rejection of the notion that human, humans, humanity, is a done deal, that who we are and what we are has been completed. In transhumanism, there's this recognition that what it is to be human is an ongoing dynamic process, and that there may come a point in time in the future when we aren't, at least biologically, what we've traditionally understood humans to be. And that implies things about more than just our anatomy. That also implies things about our culture and our society and our philosophies and our religions. And so there's much more going on to transhumanism than just interest in technology and science. There's also a very rich um, social and cultural aspect to the movement. I love it. Okay, so now that we've kind of given an introduction to transhumanism, I want each of you to just spend literally just a minute or two kind of doing the bullet points of your, of your early years slash your Mormon story and focus on the parts that you think lead breadcrumbs to transhumanism in terms of, you know, cause you know, and, and of course Lincoln, your, your, your story, like, like Carl's deserves its own deep dive. We're not going to do that today because I really want the focus today to be on transhumanism, but give us just a little bit about your background, your Mormon background and the breadcrumbs that lead us today to your interest in transhumanism. And then, sure. and then Carl, you can refresh sure. us a tiny bit too. Yeah. So I, I was born to uh, parents who uh, were Mormons, members of the church. And my father was a computer programmer. And nice. for those who know how old I am, yeah. they would know that, that was not a popular profession. Like mainframes or? Like yeah, he worked with Cobol, mainframes. Cobol programming? Or? He was one of the original coders of WordPerfect. Oh, yeah. And he also worked on software for nuclear reactors for the government, for a government contractor. So he was working in the information technology industry long mm. before it became popular to do so. So Out I grew Utah up in Utah County. No, no. Um, I was born in Utah because my parents were at BYU originally. We moved to Chicago. Oh. Five years there, moved to Washington State, five years there, and then came back to Utah when I was 10-ish. Okay. Yeah. So, so dad's a computer programmer before it was cool. That's right. Yeah. And so I, that's what I grew up with. Uh -huh. um, I, Did you have a TRS-80 when it came out? Like, do you remember we that? had We had different computers in our home. The coolest computer we had in our home when I was really little was actually uh, kind of just a, a uh, monitor uh -huh. that was connected to a mainframe in an, you know, oh. far away in another part of the city. Oh, wow. And when it wasn't being used for work-related stuff, my dad and I would use it to play text-based adventure games. Wow. 
on a mainframe computer. Like mud kind of stuff? Um, have, are you familiar with the, so it doesn't matter. Legend of Zork? It wasn't uh, Legend sure, of Zork, sure, but sure. along those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just it, it describes something in text and you tell it what you want to do. But did you have the early Apples or the early Commodore, you know, um, any of those? Do you remember those? My, my neighbor had a Commodore that we'd go program. We, <laughs> we would copy all of the text out of his magazine word for uh -huh. word in, yeah. into his Commodore. Basic and language. then we would run, yeah. Like basic. We had all those computers too, that yeah, too. We had a blast with that. Yeah, so that, that's the environment I grew up in. And my parents um, were active participants in the church. I was an active participant in the church. And um, so technology was just part of life, always was. I grew up that way. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was a little bit about my father. My mother, on the other hand, she was a convert to Mormonism from Catholicism. And her emphasis in her Christianity, even as a Catholic, and she liked it even more about Mormonism, was the emphasis on work, on doing something with our faith. She, all the time when I was a kid, she would quote the idea, the scripture of faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to just believe something. What are we doing about it? Mm -hmm. Are we making something of this belief that we have? Mm -hmm. So I was, I was raised by a, a very driven mother, um, very practical mother. My father was very technologically oriented. And so our interpretation of Mormonism was colored by those worldviews, very practical, um, very compatible with technology. And in, in, in our homes, there was never an incompatibility between science and religion. Nice. Um, so evolution wasn't a boogeyman. It was never an issue in our nice. homes. It was an issue around us that we were I mean, let, I don't know if, if people in the church today know, um, how much, more difficult it used to be mm -hmm. to talk about evolution in the yeah. church. It, oh, yeah. it, there was a time when it was hard. It was worse. <laughs> now, now, at least for me, it's easy to talk about. Yeah. I know some people have varying mileage on that, but I, I talk about it regularly, not every, not every time, but when it comes up in church, I talk about it and, sure. and it goes by fine now. Yeah. And but so, when I was a teen, Bruce R. McConkie would have labeled it one of the seven deadly heresies. That's right. So it was just it was bad. It was yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it wasn't in my home. What I, what I, yeah. But I observed that around, and that was actually troubling for me as a kid to observe that it was a problem for other people. Yeah. Because I didn't for see Mormons. any, yeah, for yeah. other people that, you know, I, these were my friends and, you know, extended family. Yeah. Why was it bugging them? I yeah. saw no problem with evolution mm -hmm. being compatible with my religion. Yeah. And my parents didn't raise me to see any problem with that. Yeah. And so... Um, over time, anyway, just to, I, I don't want to spend all, all the time talking about my history. I went through a faith crisis eventually, like lots of... Okay, really quick. So you did seminary? I did. Did you do the mission? Yes. Where'd you serve, where'd you serve your mission? France, Marseille. Okay, fun. And then you, did you, what'd you do for college? I studied philosophy at BYU. BYU, okay. And then you got married in the temple? I did. Okay. Yep. Okay, so you got all those Mormon check boxes. I, I checked of all the boxes. Yes. Okay, fun. And okay. and by and large, these are all experiences that I continue to value deeply to today. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what, like around what year was the faith crisis kind of really? Well, started? it started brewing as a teenager. Okay. And it didn't culminate until my father died of his third cancer when I was a young adult, oh, so post marriage. Sorry. Okay. And that's when you know very very predictable challenges to faith hit me hit me really hard, like they do to many of us. And I struggled deeply, for example, with the problem of evil um, and, and various other things, but that was a big one. You know, how, how could it be that God is there with all the suffering that I observe and now and experiencing and observing in my father? I mean, dying of cancer, he had esophageal geal cancer. Mm, that's a hard one. Um, it, it, was, it was not pretty, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and so watching him go through that, having a good relationship with him, caring about him deeply and not wanting him to suffer that way. And then also seeing the way it affected my family. Um, it, it was, it, that was probably one of the harder times of my life. I was also a young parent at the time, had my first child just barely. I was trying to, you know, start to support my family financially. So everything about life was stressful, but then he dies and I, you know, I, it broke, it broke my faith. Um, what year was this about? This would have been in the late 1990s. Okay. Yeah. My father died in 1998. Okay. Um, which also uh, corresponds with the the boom of the original World Wide Web was right. coming about yeah. about that yeah. same time. Sure. And yeah. I, I, was, I had worked for dot-com companies. At the time when he died, I was working for a dot-com startup that eventually failed like so many did. Um, so you studied philosophy, but you got into tech. Because I grew up a programmer because okay, of my father. Okay, okay. Yeah, I later got an MBA at BYU as well. 
but yeah, um, nobody would pay me to be a philosopher. They would pay <laughs> me to program computers. Yeah. yeah. So I spent a couple of decades in corporate environments doing computer programs, software okay. engineering. All right, fun. Yeah. And and so yeah, I had a faith crisis. I. I continued to practice, um, continued to go to church during my faith crisis. I didn't talk all that openly about my loss of faith. I wanted to approach it as constructively as I could because I loved the people around me. Mm -hmm. And um, it was during that period of time when I was trying to reconstruct my own identity. Let me ask you, did you actually hit kind of a, a consideration of atheism or agnosticism during that time? Yeah. I did not openly identify as an atheist with my close friends. I would joke that I was agnostic towards any extraterrestrial humanoid deities. <laughs> and that was the way I would try to put it to make it, it sounds a little funny, right? So it would relieve the tension and then we could talk about it. That's how Leonard Nimoy or Spock would describe his <laughs> there you religious go. points of view. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, functionally I was an atheist at that point in okay. time. Okay. So you did hit that. I did. Should I say rock bottom, Kara? Is that an insult <laughs> to call that rock bottom? I'm on top of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and actually, actually wasn't for me the hardest part about it. The harder, there were harder parts about it in more kind of fundamental ways about just creating value and purpose in life. Mm -hmm. The question about the existence of God was tangential in some ways mm. to those deeper issues. Yeah, yeah. That, um, like what are you going to do with your life, basically? Yeah. What, what was, what was the value of living? Yeah. You know, what, 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 what should I make of this? Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, it, it was, it was a hard time for me. And I don't want to say that in a sense of that I'm asking for any pity. I'm not because almost all of us go through right. a hard time like that at some point. Sure. And, and I recognize that. So it's just, um, more, more of an acknowledgement that, Hey, I'm like everybody else. Yeah. I've, I've gone through this. And, and so during that period of time, um, is when I encountered, and at first I didn't know it by name, but I encountered transhumanism. And that and various other influences. Was it like on an AOL chat or like what? Um, Do you remember? It was not on an AOL. So this, this was the late 90s. This is pre-Google. Early 2000s. Yeah. So Google came about during the period of time. Yeah. Uh, two, two, of the, two of the influences that I encountered separately. And, and I didn't know at the time that they were actually kind of part of the same movement were, um, a philosopher called Nick Bostrom. Um, he's a philosopher out of the UK, Oxford university and a technologist inventor named Ray Kurzweil, mm -hmm. um, inventor of the Kurzweil keyboards. Mm -hmm. I, I encountered various things that they had written during that period of time. And at, and I didn't know that they were connected ideologically at the time, but I started reading some of their thoughts and they resonated really deeply with me. And, and in strange ways that we're going to talk about really deeply with my Mormon background as well. There were other influences that also kind of um, mattered a lot to me during that period of time. I was reading a lot of William James, the philosopher. I was reading a lot of Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher. And, um, Oddly, I was also going back and, and very carefully reading the New Testament, especially the epistles of Paul at that time. And those were all big influences on me during that same period of time when I encountered transhumanism. So that, that's kind of, that leads up to the point where I bump into transhumanism. That might be a good place to. Okay. So, uh, so like you remember, do you remember reading the word transhumanism where, when do you even remember like, like finding out that it was a named philosophy with the yeah. community behind it. Do you even remember where and when that happened? Yeah. So, uh, one of the philosophers I just mentioned, Nick Bostrom, the first paper that I ever read that he wrote was in philosophical quarterly. And the title of the paper was, um, are we living in a computer simulation? Really back yeah. then? Oh yeah. They were talking about that. That, that he, I mean, that's an idea the, that people the talk proponent about proponent or the initial, um, not the first, but yeah, very early. One, one of the first to kind of describe and articulate the simulation hypothesis, right? Yeah. Wasn't he pretty much, it's attributed to him, right? Well, the formalization of it, yes. <clears throat> yeah, okay. the argument. And like I said, it was published in Philosophical Quarterly. This is a high quality philosophical journal. So yes, philosophers have been talking about that idea for a lot longer than popular media has been talking about it. Fun. Anyway, I encountered, I encountered that and I followed up on his background and it turned out 
that he was one of the founders of an organization called the World Transhumanist Association. Hmm. So it's been around. Do you have an idea how long? Um, just since the early 2000s. Oh, so it's relatively new. Yeah. Maybe we'll include a link to that in the show notes. They now call themselves Humanity Plus. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Kara will get that in the show notes. So when I, I followed up on his background, I found that. And I, 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 that's, I think, when I first encountered the word transhumanism. And, and I started reading more about it. And very soon after, I realized, you know what? I'm a transhumanist. I always have been. I just didn't have a word for it. A transhumanist. That's I right. mean, that's an identity, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to get to like, how does a Mormon decide they're allowed any other identity than Mormon? But we, we won't make you answer that at, no. at first. Oh, yeah, anytime. You yeah, yeah. Let we'll me know you want me to, to answer that. We'll come that. back to that. Okay, fun. So uh, thank you so far, Lincoln. That's yeah. a great summary of your story. Sorry to make you do it so no, that's fine. quickly. Great. Carl, uh, Maybe do the same thing, but just kind of in bullets because people yeah, can yeah, reference no your story too. So I would just say that, um, you know, like many of us, many who are watching this program, I had to reevaluate certain narratives that I'd grown up with, you know, that in, uh, as, as further knowledge. You're, you were and, raised Mormon, <clears throat> yeah. did seminary. Yeah, I, like, I, seminary council even. Uh -huh. <laughs> all, do the bullets. Did all the boxes. Do the I, I, um Grew up in the church, uh, kind of went through all of the, those programs, went on a mission to Brazil. Okay. Uh, later on, met uh, my wife, Cammie, who we're still married, um, at, the, at BYU. And um, we have four kids, and they're getting older now, you know, in college and stuff like that. Um, but anyway... You um, look super young, by the way. Both oh. of you do. But. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, maybe it's my last name or something. You know, I, I'm <laughs> not sure. It's a great last name. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what I would say is like in the course of maybe just not too long after getting married, uh, you know, the amount of information on the internet was just exploding at that time. And so I started being exposed to new ideas, new information about church history that I hadn't been exposed to before. Is that part of Swab or something else? Um, I think Swab, um, probably I had been exposed to most of these ideas prior to, to joining Swab, but uh, we definitely carried on a lot of debates and Lincoln yeah. was so persistent in like, he had such a stamina with these debates that some people called him the robot prophet. I'm not sure he likes that <laughs> nickname, but um, the idea that he could like, you know, in great detail, uh, ex like explain his philosophy um, and was very patient when other people, you know, might disagree or have, have issues. But um, I, I just got exposed to information that, um, made me realize that some of the cherished kind of narratives that I'd grown up with that seemed to make so much sense were more complicated than I thought. And I was then faced with the question of, do I discard all of this? Is there any value left here? In Mormonism. Um, in Mormonism. <clears throat> yeah. And if so, how much value? And if there isn't value in certain things, do I keep doing them? And if I do, how? You know, what, what kinds of new approaches do I need to figure out? And around the same time, Lincoln and I got connected and we started meeting on a monthly basis at his house uh, with um, Lincoln and a few other friends. Around what year? Uh, this would have been a, like 2004, okay. 2003 right when, Yeah, that's right when I maybe met you guys. Yeah. 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 And in the course of doing this, you know, one of the things that I think really resonated with me about transhumanism in particular and these ideas that we started discovering before we even knew exactly what to call it was this idea that, um, you know, a lot of the changes that are occurring in this, the dispensation of the fullness of times, are really astounding and surprising. Even if you're just looking at it from a secular, purely secular perspective, think of all of the things, you know, before these came out, um, you know, uh, no, no one would have imagined we'd have so much computing power in our pocket and access to so many things. Um, we used to have to print out directions, you know, on how to get to some place. And even before that, you had like a map in your car and you had to just like navigate somehow. So crazy. Somehow the people still figured out how to get to places. But anyway, uh, we, hey, did you know that, that once upon a time, <laughs> I think we've had this conversation before to get somewhere, you had to buy a huge thick book of maps and if you were like, and you buy it by city yeah. and like, oh, I'm going to Texas or, or you'd have a, a, a nationwide map 
Yeah. And you'd thumb to like Texas and then you'd have a map and the you'd Atlas. John, and, you know, you're and, talking to the daughter of a truck driver who he would take me to AAA <laughs> before a trip to go pick out maps. Like it was the freaking candy oh, store. So like that. it was a treat for me. Of like, awesome. we'll get a map of here. Maybe we'll like sl slide up to Wait, Wisconsin. Are you saying I'm map splaining you? Is that you're map splaining <laughs> a truck driver's daughter right now. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> so you, you had a little bit of an unusual upbringing, but anyway, yeah, like we, that's an understatement as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember printing off MapQuest all yeah. through high school when I needed to go to Disneyland and MapQuest from Provo to Anaheim and every street in between. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. So, um, you know, we were just watching all the, observing all these changes that are occurring in the world and going, what if like some of the more traditional prophecies about the so-called last days like, what if they are going to happen, but just in a different way than we had thought? And then we even asked further questions about, like, wait, what if some of the hoped-for winding-up scenes that many religious people, including Mormons, um, anticipate, what if they actually depend on our choices here and now? Are they just going to happen inevitably, or are they things that will depend on our choices and then we thought, wait, what if like nothing is going to happen unless we do something, <laughs> right? Like what if it, like God is waiting on us just as much as we might be waiting on God, right? Uh, so some of those kinds of questions really led us in this direction of like, is our faith just about an afterlife, just this thing that you just have to like sit here and check off all the boxes and then just wait for something good to happen later? Or should it actually be transforming the world that we currently live in? right? And what's weird about it is both Christianity and Mormonism have veins in both directions where they, some folks just think that it's all in anticipation of, of, of some future time. Um, but really when you look at the, like the early seeds of both Christianity and Mormonism, they were about transforming the world we currently inhabit and not waiting That's right. until some afterlife, right? And so this, in some ways, like reinvigorated a type of faith, even if it was a little different from some of the ways we've been raised, if that makes sense. It does. So there's at least two big branches I'm <clears throat> wanting to go down. One is just a recognition that both of you had a faith crisis, a fundamental core faith crisis, probably as a precursor to your interest in transhumanism. Uh, true? Yeah, yeah. 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 And then the second, and then a second branch of that is that in some sense, I guess you could almost say that transhumanism maybe even helped fill in the gaps of and or provided new meaning to the parts of your faith that either were changing or that had evaporated. Is For that sure. also fair to? Definitely, yeah. So in some sense, it's not, I don't want to call it like, it's not apologetics in a classic sense, but it's like, it's like an evolution of faith. Let's just say Orthodox Mormon faith is kind of a 1.0 version. Add, have a faith crisis, add transhumanism. It's sort of like a resurrection of faith with a, with a, full, with a philosophy melded in. And that's kind of what, I, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on. One of the things I like about it, it's, it's just like, yeah, if you're in faith crisis, there are lots of ways you can go. One is to learn about transhumanism and that might revitalize, because I don't, like, I don't mean to rant on this, but like, I don't want people to leave the church if it can work for them. If they're enjoying the church, if it's providing meaning, if they don't want to leave and, and, or if you can't leave for whatever reason, then I, then, then we're happy to help people find ways to make it work. And so I guess that's one thing that strikes me is it, it transhumanism isn't fair Mormon, but transhumanism is a way potentially to revitalize your Mormonism into a new version. A good friend of mine um, shared a really like moving description of her faith crisis, and she described it almost as, um, in a way, what the what the original sort of followers of Jesus may have, may have felt like when he died, because I think for for them it was like a total surprise. They were like, "We thought we were going to conquer and come out on top, and now he's dead." Right? Um, the death of God is kind of a way you could think of a faith crisis in a way. It's like my whole my whole meaning, my whole life has been destroyed. Everything that I used to live for is is gone. What what happens now? And then she said that in a way this like 
new way of looking at the world, all the certainties she had clung to um, were no longer valuable, no longer worked for her. But in a different way, she found God again. God had raised from the dead again, but in a form that she hadn't been looking for, right? Mm -hmm. And so for her, this was a different you know, thing that she had found, but it was interesting to use that analogy to talk about a faith crisis that you know, all the thing, the reasons for getting out of bed in the morning had somehow gone away, but then there were some new ones that you found. And I think each person here probably can relate to that in some way or another. Like each of us has had to find new motivations and reasons for getting out of bed in the morning. Right? Totally. Totally. Cool. Okay. And so I love that. And then it sounds like, tell me if I'm wrong, but we, we, when we had Randy Bell on recently, we talked about God and Christianity, and we talked about kind of, I, th this is a term I remember learning a few years ago, the big G God versus the small G God. The big G God is maybe the God that we, it's the God of the lost keys. It's the, it's the God that many of us were raised with in Mormonism where it's like, oh, little, little white boy in, you know, Hiram, Utah, lost, loses his keys, prays, Heavenly Father helps him find his keys. Heavenly Father's like this grand puppet master that's orchestrating everything that happens on the earth. A sparrow doesn't fall without God sort of, when people die, it's God deciding who's dying and where does the hurricane go and who dies and what, what illnesses are allowed versus not allowed. That's kind of a, a certain, let's say, big G interventionist kind of God. Um, and then, and then we've talked about this idea of a small G God or maybe a deistic God, which is more this idea that God set things up, but then for whatever reason has become busy or is preoccupied or has moved on or just doesn't feel like direct intervention is the way, which then introduces this idea that I love, which almost sounds a little bit Buddhist esque, which is no, 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 live in the present moment don't focus on the afterlife. Don't focus on the past. We have to create our future because there's no God that's going to save us. In some sense, maybe God set things up. Maybe there is power out there. But if anything's going to happen, it's going to be us saving ourselves or we're, or we're an important partner with God in whatever's going to happen. They literally, it, and that's why it's a small G God because it implies that God can't transform us without our, our active reciprocation and participation in that transformation. And that's what I'm hearing is, it's actually refreshing, it's a, it's a point of view that I actually value and, and find important, because if we just think God's gonna save, that's the most destructive form of Christianity I'm aware of, is this idea that we're not responsible stewards of the earth, God's gonna save us, Let's just go buy, it's buy tents and ammo and and go up to the mountains because God's got to deliver us because otherwise this life sucks and only Jesus can escape. You know, that we're not getting anywhere with that philosophy. So I, I, I you were saying it's, it's escapist. Yeah. yeah, it's escapism. Yeah, on what you know this this version of theology that you're describing and, and it's sad and it's destructive. Yeah. The, the one qualifier I would put on your accounts, though, is that I wouldn't privilege that account of God with a big G. I prefer to give the big G to the account of God that makes us co-creators, that makes us um, the children of God, that makes us um, the church of the firstborn, that, make, that makes us take on the name of Christ and do the works of Christ to console, to heal, to, to raise the dead. That's the big G God. And yes, it's much more messy but much more worthy of our reverence and emulation. You don't love you don't love the demotion of I, and I wasn't trying to demote God. No, I know you were more a philosophical kind of. But I you're just don't want to give the privilege to the others. What do you mean? I don't want to give the the poor theology the privilege of getting the capital G for their God. <laughs> I want to give the you're, capital G to the God that transforms us in reality that has the real practical consequence in our lives in partnership with with your us. participation. Carrie, did you want to? Are you thinking I'm just something? nodding? I, I just it like, is interesting. Kara's like, who are these guys? Why are we interviewing them? And I'm like, trust <laughs> me, they're smart. They've thought this through a little bit. That's rude. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, John. Okay, I'm exaggerating <laughs> a little bit. 
<laughs> no, I'm nodding because I think that's beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. <laughs> and glaring. Dirty at John. stares. <laughs> anyway, John right. doesn't like that I'm funnier than him, so he tries to dig everyone. I don't even get half her jokes because I'm not smart enough. Like, so They're I'm very just subtle. I like put up these alley oops, and he doesn't even slam dunk them. So that's what you guys are here for. I'm Ignore like, him. Why is she talking? Anyway. She's my token. You know. I'm, I'm <laughs> why is she making jokes and trying to add value? <laughs> No, you're token place. I'm kidding. I'm totally no, but I totally understand trouble. what you're saying about the capital G God. I mean, uh, just just like you said, interventionist, right? The the notion that, um, with these very simple kind of quid pro quo kind of calculations about, well, I've done this many good things, so I deserve these blessings, right? Yeah. So the prosperity gospel. And yeah, all that. absolutely. Not yeah. not you're you're not necessarily a big fan <clears throat> of that kind of. No, I mean, I think it's actually a form of idolatry, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm really grateful, Carl, you're here because you and I have had some disagreements or even debates over the years. You've always kind of like been friendly, but also willing to kind of disagree. Uh -huh. And a lot of times it's gotten acrimonious with other friends or former friends where I've had to ban them or block them or whatever. Somehow we've been able to still have a friendship where, where we can have that healthy, robust dialogue and exchange and we're still friends, and I love that. And it sounds like that's part of transhumanism's. You should hear us argue with each effect. other. What? You should hear us argue with each other. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, skin. I think we have a so. So one thing that I really value in Mormonism that it kind of speaks to this is this um, these principles that Joseph Smith um, shared at the end of his life. Uh, one of them, he said, like one of the grand fundamental principles of Mormonism is friendship and to unite all people in the bonds of friendship. Um, regardless of what tribe or religion they come from. And um, I believe that we should like cling to our friendships and foster friendships even across ideological barriers. I think that's really important. And one of the things we try to do at our conferences, for example, is like invite critics to come to tell us why we're full of it, you know, and to um, critique our philosophy and, and we often invite people who don't normally talk to each other very much to kind of engage in a dialogue. Whoa, and whoa. Uh, that's, I don't want to say that's not Mormon, but it feels unfamiliar to me <laughs> given some of my experience. Well, I, I mean, I, I certainly could agree that like it, we don't always see that as often as we should anyway, but, <laughs> but that's something we want to do, you know? And, and I think that happens. Partisanship is so common, right? Um, it's common on the left and the right. And, and all the different persuasions in between where people just don't like to hear, don't like to be exposed to alternative viewpoints, right? Or at least some folks don't, but I almost like don't feel comfortable in a partisan environment. Whenever I'm yeah. in Sunday school and echo everyone chambers, is- right? Echo chambers? What's that? Sorry? Echo chambers? You yeah, yeah, yeah. a fan of echo chambers. Yeah. yeah. Um, whenever I'm in like Sunday school and everyone's like patting themselves on the back for some kind of how awesome we are. I'm always like the first one to say, well, but we kind of aren't doing this very well or, <laughs> you know, and then when I'm with someone who's like criticizing, you know, the church or other, um, other groups of people, I'll be like the first to just rise to their defense and say, well, they're still cool in this way, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I don't know, maybe I'm just a contrarian, but I just can't, um, I just never feel comfortable when I'm in a cheer cheerleading session, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I, uh, I, I loved it. Just recently on a Facebook thread, you were willing to refer to some Mormons' adoration of their leaders as adultery. Like yeah. there aren't there. Aren't, I don't always meet a lot of active faithful Mormons that are willing to sort of name our leader worship sometimes as an idolatrous. Not to throw shade on the church, but like. Well, no. I mean, this actually, if it's all right, like this was one concept that was so empowering for me actually is like almost always um, f sort of falling away or, or, or changing your views or changing your behavior in some way in regards to church kinds of activities or church expectations almost in my, in my case was all almost always characterized to me as a, a kind of sinful thing to do, a kind of thing that was like a step down from what I was doing before but when I realized that some of these ways of um, engaging in ultra orthodoxy, whatever you want to call it, um, were actually a form of idolatry, that actually helped me to characterize my struggle and my search 
as a search for something better and something more rather than something less and something inferior, right? That really empowered me in a way, whereas before I couldn't see any change in activity or change in approach to the church as anything but a step down. But this really made me go, wait, we've made mis- we're making mistakes or we're, we're doing this wrong in some cases. And suddenly I could, I could say, no, I'm not seeking to like get off easy. I'm actually trying to bump it up a notch, if you will. Yeah. Does that make sense? I love it. I love it. Okay. So let, let's, the next kind of phase of this conversation that occurs to me is you both have your faith crisis and you both discover humanism. What was it about? So what you could have done is just kind of like, okay, I'll do transhumanism over here and I'll also be a Mormon or not but they could have been very paralleled. Was there something about Mormonism or were there things about Mormonism that were like, whoa, wait, there might be connections here where kind of like the peanut butter and jelly sandwich or the Reese's, like the peanut butter and the chocolate might go good together. What was it about Mormonism that you felt connected enough with transhumanism to make you want to kind of put the peanut butter and the chocolate together? Oh yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely that way. Transhumanism and Mormonism are better together. Um, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Some that, some that I'll mention, um, that come to mind offhand include, first of all, that Mormonism is a physicalist, uh, cosmology in Mormonism. In our scriptures, we, we read that all spirit is matter that already situates Mormon cosmology squarely in the realm of science. At least it should. Now it doesn't play out that way in all of our heads, but I, I would I would suggest for those of us who are doing kind of a a consistent, a coherent Mormon cosmology that has to f- inform the way we think about the world, and it has to lead us toward a science positive cosmology, which of course lends itself, which is consistent with transhumanism as well. Another, another important area of overlap was that in Mormonism, uh, Joseph Smith situated us in the dispensation of the fullness of times when knowledge never before revealed would come to earth that would enable us to do things we were never able to do before. And we often talk about this in Mormonism, like there's something that's supposed to be special about our day. And the scriptures describe it as a day when eventually We'll live to the age of a tree, it says, and then we will be changed and there will be death no more. And as Paul says in the New Testament, changing the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality. Joseph Smith in in the Doctrine and Covenants calls this the day of transfiguration. So this idea that something is supposed to be happening now, something really important, and that God is providing more revelation than ever before to fuel this change, Mm. that parallels quite strikingly uh, the idea that many transhumanists advocate of accelerating technological change. And there is among transhumanists a lot of um, utopianism and even functional Mm. messianic expectations um, as a result of technological change. And that's actually really an interesting psychology to explore and has a lot of functional parallels with Mormon millennialism and messianic expectations. So technology could save us or deliver us, or technology could help us live in Zion, a technical, technological Zion. And there's also apocalyptic risks, right? right? Evil AI could could thwart these good outcomes. We have to pay attention to that. Or maybe from the traditional um, religious perspective, maybe Satan in the apocalypse will do great damage to the work, but God ultimately prevails, mm-hmm. as the story in the book of Revelation. Does that is. make... Does that make it necessarily metaphorical? In other words, one interpretation of that is the second coming of Jesus or a, a God or or a, a second coming or the adversary. If you're all of a sudden kind of using technological explanations to kind of explain those different concepts, someone would say, well, then that necessitates a more metaphorical, symbolic theology versus a more literal one with like a God with a beard, a white, a white dude with a beard with hands and, you know, feet or a Jesus that literally comes, stands on the point of Mount Olives and like, you know, fights Satan and Gog of Magog and all that. And then ushers in a millennium. It, does it need to be a more 
mythical, metaphorical, symbolic kind of faith, or or can it also be literalistic? And I think it's an interesting. I, mean, I guess it could be anything. But. It's an interesting mix of the two. Yeah. I mean, if if you interpret Christian uh, theology in the simplest way, where I mean, that, that's, I mean, the kinds of things that maybe we think when we're children, then yeah, it, it, clearly it can't be that simple. Like Adam and Eve are the first two humans and 7,000 year earth and all that. Yeah. In the very simplest sense, but in another sense, there are ways in which transhumanism and transhumanist expectations for the future inform a more literal interpretation of potential theologies, potential cosmological outcomes. So for example, whereas a lot of people a lot of Christians, progressive Christians, settle into a weaker version of theology where it's all merely metaphorical. It's all about our psychological um, and spiritual struggles interior to ourselves and maybe the way we relate with people. But they kind of back off from the cataclysmic, apocalyptic possibilities that the more literal, pre-secular interpretations of religion lead to for, you know, maybe more fundamentalist inclined people. I like to, I like to kind of characterize myself as a post secular religion person. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I, I think that there's a, a lot of weakness in a religion that goes purely metaphorical. It takes away the power and the potency of religion. And in some cases that's good because religion can be, can do bad things. And so sometimes you want religion to become more metaphorical because then they'll stop doing some of the terrorism that gets associated with it, for example. But in other cases, when religion is motivating us to do wonderful things and providing a strenuous mood to steal a phrase from William James that I mentioned <laughs> earlier, well, then you, you don't want to weaken it. You don't want it to be only metaphorical. We want, why don't we want to live in a literal millennial world where people literally don't die from aging. I'd love to live in that world. And there's reason to believe through technological interventions over time, we may be able to approach such a world literally. And so um, is it more figurative or more literal? I, it's a mix. It, I mm. think it really depends on what you mean by more figurative or literal. And then you have to explore the details. Nice. All right, Carl, I'll ask you the same question. Is there, were there any elements of transhumanism that seem to really jive with your understanding of Mormonism separate from the absolutely that, that Lincoln. Another said. really important uh, concept that I think is so core to Mormonism is the notion of uh, both a constrained God, not an absolutist God, the capital G God that you described earlier, who um, could have made the world differently than it is, but decided not to. But rather, Mormonism posits a God who found himself, to quote Joseph Smith, amid spirits and matter and sought to create laws whereby others could progress to be more like uh, him or her. And uh, so Mormonism already has this notion of a God who actually can't do any better than what we've got here, who is, you know, in, in many ways it resolves a lot of the theodicy challenges, right? because uh, God basically is a being like us, only far more advanced than we are. Um, and not only is God like us, but God is our destiny in the sense that our destiny as children of God is to become more like our heavenly parents, right? So Mormonism, I think more than any other religion, makes that front and center a part of its theology. And while some people have talked about how that's being maybe slightly downplayed lately, I still think that, you know, every time someone sings, I'm a child of God in church, those concepts are being taught. And I don't picture that hymn going away anytime soon. So I still think that, um, I still think that's getting a lot of airtime in Sunday school, if you will. And uh, so that notion of theosis, the, the idea of becoming gods is, I think, stronger in Mormonism than just about any other faith. All right. I'm, I, it just occurred to me now, uh, I, I'm guessing a topic that has been of much debate or discussion within the transhuman community, transhumanism community, because if if technology is the way that we can become like God or God-like, then it's likely or it would follow that God, him or herself, used that technology to get to where he or she is or are. <coughs> Why in the freak didn't he or her just share with us all the technological means that helped 
mother or father God get there so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and relearn all the technological advancements that got God to where they are now. I'm sure you're both smiling. So, so is that a cliche of like well, a transhumanistic discussion? I, I was just thinking about how <laughs> this was actually. Is it, hasn't God ever heard of like magazines or peer reviewed science that you <laughs> share and you build on top of other people's discovery? Like, so this exact question was asked and answered by Richard Bushman at our conference. I love it. And uh, me, and, he, me and Richard were homies. Brother Bushman, we're he, uh, we're he shared like um, what other Mormon thinkers have said about the topic, and he said that they they like presented three potential models for like how it could go down. Either we're just like rediscovering all the same things that. God has already done, and it's just really boring for God because God's just sitting there. Come on, guys, watching. Figure it out. Like everybody do the exact same thing. Um, <laughs> but he and I don't remember what the second one was, but he said the third one was his preferred model, and it was more like that every creation, every <laughs> universe, if you will, every um, world, whatever you want to call it, uh, kind of had to learn some of the same things, but also had their own little twists on it. You know, like their own unique things that accomplished that, uh, that happened only in that world, if you will. I thought that was kind of a cool way of thinking about <laughs> it, but at any rate, um, the question of like, why? So, so I think some Mormons would respond, well, actually God is revealing this all the time. And in fact, whenever those Eureka moments happen in the sciences and in other disciplines, that they're kind of a form of revelation, right? Um, and that we can only achieve that revelation incrementally because it's not like you could just sort of like zap, you know, like imagine trying to make cavemen like give them bicycles or whatever. I don't know, you know, um, whatever would be like some super or put them in a, in a, the cockpit of an airplane or something like it just wouldn't, wouldn't work very well. Right. So yeah, you give a caveman a cell phone, <laughs> they like use it as a, they don't have a cell tower for one thing, but anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think if, if we consider the purpose of life, to be only feeling okay, to avoid suffering maybe, then nothing about this world makes any sense from a theological perspective. That's a great reason to be an atheist in my opinion, if it's just to avoid suffering. Um, and, and you're right, uh, transhumanists debate this a lot, and there are a lot of atheist transhumanists because of this, because they, their reasoning is, we're solving so many problems and we anticipate to solve a lot more. I mean, transhumanists are pretty optimistic about our potential, even if, of course, we ought to also be caring about the risks along the way and the best transhumanists do. But we're optimistic about our potential. We tend to really think humans will become immortal. Okay, that, that's pretty optimistic. Um, and if we're going to become immortal, why wouldn't we just give that to our creations? And that, that's, a, that's a really challenging question on its face. But then you have to step back and say, okay, well, if we just wanted them to live the kinds of lives that we are already living, the answer to that question is we would give them that immortality, just like we, we expect to have it ourselves. And there, therefore, there's no good reason to suppose that God already exists based on that reasoning. So if God does exist, take the logic one step further, if God does exist, there must be some other reason why this world exists beyond the evasion of suffering. Because clearly, assuming transhumanists are right, which transhumanists just do assume we're right, <laughs> clearly we're going to be able to avoid the kinds of suffering that we're now enduring in the future. Mm -hmm. So what possible motivations are there? And, and that opens up an interesting debate. What other possible motivations are there? For me, there's only one that can justify the kind of suffering that we observe and experience in this world, and that's theosis. Because theosis is not just about raw power. Theosis is not, when we, when we talk about, and this gets back into the question about how Mormonism complements transhumanism, um, th this is an important part of it. Becoming like God is not just becoming more powerful. It's not becoming like Zeus. In Mormonism, the archetype or the prototype of God is Jesus Christ. And what are the virtues that we attribute predominantly to Jesus Christ? Two in particular come to mind, compassion, love, and creation, genuine creation. We're not talking about replicative creation. We're talking about 
the creation of a God and a God who can create more gods. And that, in my mind, is the only justification for a super intelligence to create a world that emulates its own evolutionary history, complete with the risks of evolutionary history. Because we face serious risks and serious suffering happens as a con consequence of those serious risks. So in my mind, the only thing that justifies that is the possibility that traversing these experiences transforms us in more ways than superficially and permits us to achieve virtues that technology on its own without experiencing the technology in certain ways could achieve. So maybe you should unpack a little bit this notion of um, emulating its evolutionary history because that didn't... Yeah, that so... A little bit hard for if, if God creates a world like ours, like what we're living in right now, and if God once went through what we're going through, which is a pretty basic claim to Mormon theology, right? God once was as we are and we can become as God is. Um, if God is doing that, then God is essentially emulating the evolutionary history that led to Godhood. And per Mormon theology does that over and over and over again. And as I said before, if the only reason we can think of for that is that God's goal is to create beings who don't suffer, well, then God has chosen a really crappy strategy for getting there. Right. Because we keep suffering over and over and over again. Yeah. So what, there has to be some other goal. Sure. And that other goal in my estimation, the only one that works for me, every, everywhere else led me to atheism. The only one that got me out of that perspective was the goal of theosis, creating more genuinely compassionate, genuinely creative beings. And I think that genuine- intelligent and powerful, right? Those also, mm, yeah. but on their own, they're insufficient. Yeah. And technology can only ever be a tool to something more important, which would be compassion and creation. It's probably worth saying that other Mormon transhumanists also um, take different stances here. Like we have some who think that God just doesn't exist yet, right? But God will exist in oh, the future. Interesting. Um, but anyway, go. You had a question. I had a question. You mentioned like living forever, immortality. So in your Mormon transhumanist view, how do you view things that are supernatural, like the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that that literally happened? And then water also, and the wine. The I, I'm more talking about bread. just like God becoming human and then going back to whatever. I would just love you to explain your ideas around the resurrection and then the Mormon theology that Christ will be coming back to reign for a thousand years. How does that intersect with the technology and the ideas of immortality so that must be a, a hot topic because that's oh for sure that yeah. mormonism loves talking about that, like that first or yeah we, we talk about this kind of stuff all the time and i'm sure there's no answer because there's no one theology no we, we don't have like some official policy on any of this this is yeah. lincoln and carl is, yeah. our perspectives. <laughs> yeah. um, al although you know our perspectives have a lot of commonalities with other mormon transhumanists of yeah. course um even if you just share kind of a common or average view sure. is fine yeah so let, let, let's you, you mentioned the resurrection um, many secular transhumanists, not all, but many secular transhumanists and, and probably most Mormon transhumanists aspire to resurrection for our dead loved ones and probably for ourselves um, in the future, a technological resurrection. We're not talking supernatural. So you use the word supernatural when you ask the question. A lot of, a lot of transhumanists and Mormon transhumanists would, re would reject the idea that any of it's supernatural, except in the sense that we just don't understand it yet. Mm -hmm. We don't have a scientific mm -hmm. explanation for it yet. But the anticipation is that we would gain an understanding of it and that God would give us means to achieve these ends. The Book of Mormon, of course, teaches that God operates through means. And Captain Moroni in the Book of Mormon says that God will not save us unless we use the means that God has already given us. And that theme carries all throughout Joseph Smith's articulation of theology. So Mormon transhumanists embrace that pretty thoroughly, that we, we aspire to resurrection, we aspire to immortality. We don't look at these as supernatural things. We look at these as things that will come about naturally, but that we have a lot to learn, clearly, before we can do that. And, and hey, by the way, Jesus in the New Testament tells his disciples to raise the dead. How seriously are we taking that? Well, transhumanists, Mormon transhumanists take that pretty seriously. Let's figure that out. How do we do that? 
And I'm guessing the pathway that's often considered is you, you find their DNA somehow, you incubate it, you're able to regrow the person. It'll it'll take more than that. Species. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, um, the idea of growing a body that's like genetically identical to someone is uh, one probably important part of it, but nowhere close to... <laughs> Doesn't, all their <laughs> right? like, experiences and their yeah, memories. Yeah, their and... connectome, which is sort of the arrangement of all their neurons that we think, at least up till now, um, based on our understanding of neuroscience, is what makes a person who they are. In many ways, you are not the atoms that make you up because 10 years ago, you were made up of completely different atoms, but now you're still John, um, even though you have completely different atoms, right? So there's this um, ancient philosophical concept called the ship of Theseus, which is about this idea of like this boat that where every single piece of the boat has been replaced um, is it still the same boat, right? And that's the that's the question that, this, that <laughs> yeah. the philosophers are debating about, right? <laughs> and so um, I think it's more effective to think of you as a pattern of information. And so when Your we spirit. are resurrecting somebody, yeah, for Lincoln, Lincoln prefers to think of spirit as that, that pattern of information. Um, and I think it makes that sounds impersonal. Sense. It sounds slightly impersonal. <laughs> well, but it's you, like it's the only, <laughs> you're the, John, you're the only pattern of information that's, Per that's perfectly John. Nobody else is that pattern, right? I mean, when I held my daughter in my arms for the first time, I said, you're such a cute pattern of information. And I gave her of a course. name and a blessing, and I refer to that every night that she goes to bed. Sweet little pattern of information. It is nerdy, and I wouldn't use that word in church when I gave a blessing. <laughs> no, we're not my, it's, we're having fun. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. But, um, but I think, doesn't that kind of make sense? You know, like this idea that it's not necessarily the atoms, but, but yeah, so um, re resurrecting someone would be a lot harder than just growing their bodies again. Um, yeah. And so I, I imagine a future in which, you know, I, I like to use this analogy of um, there, there's this really cool thing that I kind of got into because I'm into music and stuff where um, this one company was taking really old scratchy 78 RPM recordings of famous musicians playing their music back in a time when, recorded sound had just gotten started and it wasn't very high fidelity, you know? So they had like Rachmaninoff. They had a really famous jazz pianist named Art Tatum, who's just amazing. He's like, um, they said when he came in, God walked in the house because he was so amazing at his, his, um, his work. But um, they got all these old recordings and they created an algorithm that could infer based on the physical model of how a piano functions, what notes are being played in what volumes and things like that. And then they took those recordings and they replayed them on a nine foot grand piano with a high fidelity recording. And it was as if those famous dead musicians were like alive again, playing in the room. And that is sort of like a really, really small analogy of what I think might happen in the future, where as we gain a stronger understanding of how things work in the world, we start to be able to infer past patterns of information to a greater degree than we can now. So I imagine some far-flung future when we might be able to observe the past with a fidelity that we could only barely imagine now. So like we might be able to look back at this moment when we were having an interview in your studio and, sit and look at the exact atoms that make you up, make me up, make Kara up and everybody here and we could, if we wanted to, then reproduce those atoms at will. I mean, obviously, that's a level of sophistication and technology that we could only dream of right now. But I imagine that until we achieve something like that, the resurrection won't be possible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So when you're talking about like the resurrection of Jesus Christ what I hear you saying is that we don't understand because he, God would have had to use the same type of technologies that he's used for a millennium that we're going to have to understand and cope with eventually that, that Jesus Christ just became a reanimated person. And we don't have the technology yet to understand the mechanics through which God would have done something like that. But yeah, it's a so matter I think of time that before we get there. Some uh, Mormon transhumanists would take that approach of assuming that all of these things in the past really happened exactly as they were sure. told. And it, um, and just that we just don't have the technology yet. And they, I think, would generally agree that um, they were done in some way that did not violate the laws of the universe, that they actually had to follow some rules as to how those events took place. 
But there would be others who would maybe say just that um, those thing, those events may not have occurred exactly as the scriptural account claims, um, and that they may be things that still need to happen in the future, right? Um, so, for example, uh, that Jesus was there. You know, various there are various positions on Jesus's um, messiahship, and sort of like was Jesus merely. Um, demonstrating a life that we should all follow and emulate or was Jesus somehow um, you know more unique in in some specific way more divine in some specific way and actually experienced a physical resurrection right I think there's varying positions on how literally to take some of those um, those claims and you're saying across the trans like the Mormon transhumanist community that's that right, people yeah. assign a certain level of I don't know what, whether you want to call it deity or the way I like to think of it is I, I prefer to um, approach my theology in, a, in the form of a minimum viable theology. So what I would like to say is that, like, I at least believe this, but there may be other things that I would be pleasantly surprised if those things are also true. But I want to come up with a theology that works even if those other things that I that some people think are necessary aren't true, right? So, like, um, for me, like— I'm totally okay with the idea that Jesus, the story of Jesus may have been riffed on and kind of expanded and, and exaggerated to the point where Jesus's um, divinity appears more unique and magical than it actually was. Uh, I'm totally okay if that's, if that's true, because I still see value in Christianity, even if that is, even if those things have been exaggerated, right? Whereas there are other folks who stake their claims in such a way that they're like, if this is not true, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm bailing on this. I've had to go through those, the, the sort of faith challenges necessary to say, is there any value in this message? If some of the more superstitious aspects of it that cannot be proven um, are discarded. Right. And I've sort of come down on the side that Christianity is valuable to me, even if, uh, even if, I'm merely following the Christian ideal of like what the ideal way of living is. Um, even if some of the, even if the resurrection didn't happen as, as some have claimed, I still see valuable value in Christianity. And there are others who are like, if the resurrection didn't happen, we're out of here, you know? Yeah. But interesting. Yeah. I love that you said minimum viable product. Yeah. Yeah. You should, do you want to expand minimum on that? Minimum viable theology. Yeah. yeah. Minimum viable, like that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> minimum viable theology. And I think of minimum viable so, product of like when you're, you just need the bare bones of something to get you to market, to get you out there. And then you take feedback and then you develop as you go. Do you want yeah. to expand on that at all? I think that's totally. So I think I need to give credit to a friend of ours, Micah Redding, who actually founded the Christian Transhumanist Association um, after it, interacting with a number of us, um, regularly. Um, but, uh, he's this like, wait, are you saying the Mormon transhumanism movement predates the Christian transhumanism? Yes. yes, yes. How cool is that? <laughs> By about <laughs> eight years. That's awesome. In fact, Micah was like, you know what? Um, I know he, he, he blogged about a lot of this stuff and he was like, okay, fellow Christians, I know you guys might be hating on me for hanging out with the Mormons, but I got to admit that like, they're one of the few people, these, this group of Mormon transhumanists is one of the few who are like talking about this really interesting stuff, you know? Yeah. And so he started coming to Mormons our conferences. Mormons lead the charge again, everybody. <laughs> and it, and it's because of unique aspects of Mormon theology that are very unusually compatible with transhumanism. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And, and one thing I really love about this guy is he comes from a preaching tradition where they just uh, practice their sermons like regularly, but they never give them the same way twice. So it's like they're extemporaneously um, preaching, but they're very, very charismatic in it's the beautiful. way they do it. It's it's really quite quite impressive to hear him speak. But but he was the one who coined this phrase of minimum viable theology, and he was just like saying, okay, if we strip away a lot of these dogmas and other things that have accumulated through the years, is there any value still there, and what is that value? And I think thinking about your beliefs regardless of what they are in that way is a really powerful way of reconstructing faith after a crisis. If you think about it. No, I, I really get that. And I can honestly, I mean, right now, obviously the Mormon church in, in particular, the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints or the LDS church, it's kind of in a, it's at a crossroads. Some would say it's in crisis, 
but there's a lot of people because of the internet, because of technology, ironically, just because of modernity and the accessibility of information or the awakening of the general population to certain, you know, human rights issues or social justice kind of issues. The Mormon church is facing along with a lot of other Christian faiths and just religion in general, uh, but you know, potential real decline and or potential extermination. And so I could see at some point in, in, you know, I think about the white horse prophecy and like the constitution hanging by a thread. I I'm sure you guys have envisioned religion hanging by a thread or churches or the LDS church hanging by a thread. And, and if, and when it gets to that point, they're going to really be looking for people that have done this exercise of evaluating and, and locating minimum viable theology. Because if it's, if it's this all or nothing, black or white, totalistic, it's all true or it's all false. It's all exactly what it ever was claimed to be, or it's the biggest fraud ever perpetrated. That's, That's poor reasoning. What's that? That's poor reasoning, right? Yeah. And, it, but, it, but it, it's, it's, it, the people would come by it honestly because some of oh, the sure. top leaders of the church have oh, been yeah. advocating and that. What I, what I, um, and in fact, that is the kind of one of the most difficulties I continue to have on a regular basis at church is this notion that if some of these claims are not as we thought they were or different from how we thought they were, that you might as well bail and that you might as well leave. Um, and that, you know, it, I think it, it's a way of doubling down on the existing narrative, but I think it's ultimately ineffective in that, like, you kind of paint yourself into a corner more and more, and you get to the point where, you know, based on the new information that we have available to us, it's clear that those some of those ideas are untenable. And if you keep insisting on it, all you're going to do is alienate more and more people, right? And I think of that approach as profoundly un-Mormon as well, in the sense that one of those other grand fundamental principles that Joseph articulated right before he died was that a Mormon um, accepts truth. Accepts truth. So uh, one of the, he said one of the grand fundamental principles of Mormonism is to receive truth, let it come from whence it may. And if we do not gather all true principles in the world, wherever they may be found, then we're not true Mormons, right? So we should be like eagerly, eagerly like asking for our theories to be debunked. We should be eagerly asking for our assumptions to be questioned. And if we aren't doing those things, according to Joseph, we are not true Mormons, right? So I see that as a form of unauthentic Mormonism, this idea of doubling down on dogma rather than being rather than embracing truth. Even if it means you have to revise some of your core beliefs. Uh, can I ask a follow-up to that? Because sure, it sounds sure. like if you do share these kinds of things with maybe your more typical Orthodox Mormons in a Sunday school or something, do you ever get accused of you being, you know, idolaters of technology and people are like, well, we're here to learn and to grow in our relationship with God. You're idolizing something outside of this core Mormon theology. Knock it off. Yeah, for sure. If, if that's what we were doing, I would agree with them that that would be, idolatry. but do you get accused of that? that no, I don't because I, I don't, I'm, I'm careful not to pre present it that way. Okay. And because, and I, I also think that would be an inaccurate representation of what I do. The technology is a tool and the Book of Mormon, all of the scriptures are filled with God giving people tools to accomplish the work of God. But those tools aren't in themselves the point. The point is our relationships and our potential. Um, the point is our love for each other. The point is the capacity to use our love for each other to create something bigger than ourselves. And if we go to church and we talk about how important technology is, well, that's really not the point of church. Yeah, the technology is there. We can use it. And it can help us along the way. But the point of church is to talk with each other about the welfare of our souls, to reinforce each other in our commitment to take on the name of Christ and to live in accordance with what that discipleship is. If I'm doing those things, and then I say, and by the way, here are some tools to help us get there, I never have problems, and I shouldn't. No, I think it's That's fair beautiful. to say, though, that... Um, we regularly encounter some members of the church who are like saying, oh, but that's absurd. Like none of this stuff is going to be going to happen with technology. Like there's no technology involved in the resurrection or whatever. We regularly encounter people who, who do push back on that. So I, I don't want to say that like there are no, there is no pushback. Um, I do think Lincoln is especially diplomatic about the way he approaches things in church. And I often 
will not like, I more just like comment in a relevant way in a church setting and don't like try to sit there and um, throw out crazy ideas all the time, you know? Um, but yeah, because this needs a lot of context. Yeah, it does. people who need to be really on your yeah. on the level yeah. <laughs> you've already had like a four hour discussion with. Yeah, yeah it's totally. unfair to yeah. just go there too quickly. Right, right, right. Yeah, and so um, I don't get typically get a whole lot of pushback in church, but people who sort of like come to our website or know about us and then engage with us, there are sometimes skeptics who are like saying, "Oh, that's crazy!" Like, of course, of course, none of that stuff is going to happen with technology. It's totally different, right? And I would just say that, like, if you look at a lot of Mormon thinkers, they've said that, no, clearly um, God doesn't violate sort of the laws of the universe, and these things have to happen in some natural way. Um, so, yeah. So, like, it to, just to be fair with your question, like, there, it's not like everyone's, like, just totally accepting of all, the, no, all these we, ideas. we get criticisms, but the most common response among members of the church to what we do is kind of a cautious interest. That's the most common <laughs> response interest. by far. Um, and I would say that negative responses, hostile responses are less common than the enthusiastic, I am joining that association now response. Mm -hmm. We get the enthusiastic response way more often than the hostile response. Okay. So there's yeah, and I think, I just want to add, I think you guys explain it really clearly and really beautifully. So anyone who does misunderstand it and wants to like call it something else, that's their loss for like not having an actual genuine curious interest in, in what you're doing. So, yeah. Thank you. yeah. So uh, maybe you've already answered this, but you know, th there was a time I remember in the nineties, I think, or eighties where the church actually, you know, discouraged quote study groups. There was probably a lot of concern about like dialogue and Sunstone and the Mormon history association or whatever. And the church just, you know, th they're the prophets they're, they, they interpret the scripture. They're going to tell you what's important stay away from study groups or anything that isn't kind of correlated. Um, so, so the church is, the Mormon church historically has had kind of a love hate relationship sometimes with any alternative movement, mm -hmm. but especially one that maybe starts to tinker with authority or with, uh, ordinances or, or with theology, et cetera. Has there ever, ever been in any instance, any manifestation of church leaders, either locally or at a higher level, finding out about transhumanism uh, and expressing concern and or even like cautioning people to stay away from it or or even disciplining someone for believing it or following it? Or is it never even uh, been perceived as a potential threat by anyone at any level? So um, I have lots of interesting stories related to this. Um, <laughs> But let me first say, I, I have never encountered, nor have I ever heard of anyone encountering any uh, challenge from any church authorities about Mormon transhumanism. Never once. Okay. Um, and I've been the president and CEO openly, very vocally, of the organization for a decade. Yeah. And never once um, I'm in had that a position problem. now, by the way. You are? Okay. Yeah. Current okay. president and CEO. Yeah. I never once had problems with church authority. But among other members, there have been what I would classify as a range from humorous to really frustrating experiences. Um, an example of, of something maybe in between the two would be uh, a former member of my ward on one occasion um, going to my bishop behind my back and saying, did you know that he's a transhumanist and he runs a transhumanist organization? Hmm. And, and my bishop- like, at What the, is that? Yeah, my bishop was like, <laughs> What is that? <laughs> and, and he said, so my bishop's response to this person in my ward, I found out was, well, I'll ask him about it. So my bishop, really cool guy, um, asked, asked me about it. We went in, we had a talk. He asked me about transhumanism. I explained it to him and he goes, that's really cool. <laughs> and so um, very often there are people among just general membership who feel and express, very often is, an, is, is too strong of a word. Occasionally there are people who feel threatened by it and express that in ways that do seek to cause social harm for, for Mormon transhumanists, but they're more rare than the people who are enthusiastic about it. Okay. And by and large, you know, people like all of my bishops um, have either heard of or, you know, or already knew that I was a Mormon transhumanist and they've either thought it's cool or they just don't even care about it. Okay. For me, it's interesting that like, um, the, this, the gatherings that we have and like the discussions I have and the explorations I engage in as part of the group are so, 
so fulfilling for me that I don't feel very much of a need to like very strongly like advocate for the, these things in a church setting. I mean, of course I will um, share relevant comments when I think they come up, but um, I don't feel the need for like recognition or, or validation from my fellow ward members. So it's like most of them don't know no idea. about my involvement, but those who do are like, oh, wow. In fact, this older couple who I really love in my ward came to me other the other day and they're like, hey, we went to your website. I'm like, what website? And they're like, oh, the, the Mormon Transhumanist Association. And they're, they're like saying, this is really cool. Like, you know, nice. ask, you know so, um, so I think some of them who already, you know, thought of me as a friend just see it as like a way of putting our faith into practice, yeah. you know? Okay. <clears throat> um, these are going to be just a couple of really rapid fire questions. Sure. Do you have a sense for like, how many Mormon transhumanists have ever existed in some way where they've reached out or joined something or like, is it hundreds, yeah, so is it thousands? Our, like our current membership, I mean, in some ways, like we suffer from the same weakness of the LDS church where it's like anyone who's um, formally affiliated, just sort of generally we keep a track of that, that they've done that, but we don't always have as easy of a notion of like how many of those continue to think of themselves this way. Um, but over a thousand people, roughly like 1100 or so have, um, affiliated as either basic or voting members Okay. and voting members are those who can like select and be involved in the election of officers and board members and things like that. It's those, a nonprofit. It's a 501c3 it's a non Yeah. 501c3 nonprofit. And that would be between five and 10% of the overall membership. So like from 50 to a hundred individuals are voting members. When you guys hold an, an annual conference, and at the end we we're going to talk about the conference. Yeah. Uh, on average, let's say pre-COVID, what was the height of how many people would attend? Uh, I think our best attendance was when Richard Bushman came, and that was just over a hundred people. Okay, fun. But we're actually expecting two hundred people at the event that we're t that's taking place in March. It's going to be pretty big, and it has a breakout appeal. I think that's a lot broader than some of the other topics we've covered. So. We're kind of casting a wider net this time around. It's going to be focused on um, decentralization, specifically technologies like blockchain and Web3, which is something I've personally been really closely involved in, and Lincoln actually is pretty involved in that space as well. So we're really excited about this. It's a topic that a lot of people are curious about right now as well. And has theological ramifications. <laughs> and we what? are... we're We're bringing in... Actually, some does God use Ethereum? Does, <laughs> are there what are the what are the the buzzword the ac acronym? I'm I'm totally botching. Does it. God the, use the blockchain? The blockchain, no, but the <laughs> NFT fungible NF NFTs. Does God have NFTs? Does God have an NFT? <laughs> Maybe like, you are an church? NFT. Am I an NFT? Is that what it is? Is the <laughs> I spirit never thought of an that NFT? One, but that's quite interesting. John is an <laughs> NFT. I am an <laughs> NFT. <laughs> You'll have to come to the conference to find out. <laughs> no, but I will say, and sorry for you know being a little bit sort of promotional at this moment, but. Um, We've had some generous donations that have made it possible to bring in some really top tier people who don't normally come to Utah um, that uh, I would say are well worth the price of admission. We're not breaking even on the conference where we never it's, do. It's a, it's a money sink, you know, but it's part of our core mission, which is to bring these ideas to light and share them with more people. So I would say if you're at all interested in blockchain and crypto, or related technologies, um, it's well worth your while. I'm wondering what they could possibly have to do with religion. And while I'm on the topic, why don't I just like throw out um, how they register? Is that okay with you? Or do you want to wait till the end? Or Yeah, we'll, but we will so, do this at the end. Yeah, so just go to um, mtaconf.org. And we did make a special promo code for um, Mormon Stories listeners. <laughs> so MS friend, all caps, one word. All right, Kerry's getting this down is we'll get you 20% off the conference. Okay, hey, fun. There you go. And the the early, early bird, bird rate ends <laughs> on February 15th, so jump in there if it sounds exciting to you cuz it won't uh, it will slightly increase in price, but uh, yeah, and I've got a few more questions so I don't want to lose people. Um, uh, my turn? No, well, can, can I ask, I ask you a question? I well, or, or, okay, you want a volley? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'll come back. I'll come back. Okay. So you mentioned the ways that you feel like transhumanism and mormonism uh Conf what's the word? Configure nicely together. Compliment. Compliment, Compliment each other. Yeah. Um, nicely together. Um, what are some ways that maybe they don't, 
And I don't know if this is true, but this is the first one that comes to my mind. When I think of the future, I think of us moving into more of a, like a poly gendered, less gendered, like less, uh, uh, divisive about our gender differences is what I view in the future. And Mormonism has a theology that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, gender being eternal from the pre-existence. Um, how does transhumanism and Mormonism work out those ideas? Sure. Um, regarding, I'll start with the Mormon aspect of it, just to let people know um, what context I'm answering the transhumanist part in. Mormonism in the proclamation to the family talks about gender being eternal. It does not say that gender is unchanging. Mm -hmm. Those are very different things. Um, in fact, the scriptures reject the notion um, DNC 19 in particular rejects the notion that eternal is unchanging. And it actually goes out of its way to say that God uses that to provoke us, this idea that eternal is unchanging because eternal damnation is not endless. It actually ends at some point, it changes. So eternal is not the same thing as unchanging. And I do I totally share the church's perspective that gender is important. Um, now, some many members of the church might think that that means that there's only binary important genders. I don't, I think that there's evidence to the contrary, that there's not just a binary of genders and that gender is often constructed. Um, and, but I think that it remains eternally important. That's where I completely agree with what I think is actually the doctrine of the church, even though it gets presented in lots of other ways. Um, can I add a little bit on that? Sure. And then I'll go into the transhumanism bit. Yeah, so on that as well, I think that we do have some prior precedents in our history for a notion of family that could be redeemed in a way that is a little bit more accommodating for some of the things we're now learning about gender. And that's in the sense that, like, I think we used to think of family as bigger than the nuclear family, which is like this notion of just parents and children in a single household by themselves. I really think that concept is actually fairly modern and not that eternal. Sure. And if we look at the history of humanity, it's probably more likely that most humans have been born into a sort of a polygamous or dynastic type of larger family uh, grouping. Our genes say so. And uh, so I think that, you know, even when you look at the early days of the church, um, you see this notion of family as being a more multi-generational, multi-extended kind of a thing where you might have your odd uncle or aunt that never got married. You might have various people who, because of their life circumstances, just um, something different was in the cards for them. And I see in early Mormonism more of a communal conception of family. Um, and, you know, even so, so much so that uh, in the early days, people were being sealed as friends to one another in other ways. Um, and so I think that it, we, we even have Brigham Young's son who was like, like to cross dress and sing opera. And he actually gave concerts and people paid to go to his concerts. And he was a beloved son of Brigham Young who, and even though this um, eccentric uh, sort of habit of his was um, different than most of the other people his age, it was like he was doing it and people seemed to be okay with it, right? So. So I think in the early days of the church, we have a possibly more expansive view of, of gender even than now in the church. Um, I'm not saying that there weren't other prejudices that we might have encountered back then, but I do think it's quite interesting to, when you have the, the perspective of a full context of history, it helps you to be able to inform these debates and discussions in ways that um, are, I think, more sophisticated than you can if you just have this really myopic view of how we think of things right now. Yeah, because, I mean, I one of the reasons why I'm not Mormon anymore is because I can't sustain the leadership because I don't think that they're led by God. And so maybe eventually now or later we'll have to get into, like, how you view the leadership, how you, because it sounds like you are, you know, adding this Mormonism with this, this general framework, like you mentioned earlier, like the, <laughs> what was the wording? Uh, Minimum viable theology. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and, and then saying this is the framework of Mormonism and then adding some more things and maybe like recontextualizing and redefining the words a little bit. So Lincoln, you just said that the, you know, the proclamation of the family says, he, says that gender is eternal, but it sounds like you're kind of changing the definition because that doesn't seem like how the leadership would define that word. They would say you're born either male, female, there's nothing else. That's how I would, John, do you agree that like, that's how the, that's how the current leadership, if you sustain them, that's how they view it. So what do you do with that kind of, 
that kind of very much like dogmatic yeah. myopic view? A few things come to mind. The first is that um, I, I'm hesitant to say that the leadership all thinks the same thing on any nuanced topic like this. Sure. Although I, I will, I'll acknowledge that I probably quite a few think pretty much what you've just um, described. Um, and, and so you ask, you know, uh, this question about the church and what do I think of the leaders? Well, I love the church and I support the church and I love the leaders of the church and I support them. I also love and support my wife, but we don't always agree with each other. Um, sometimes disagreements become hostile and sometimes for good reasons, relationships end. Um, my relationship with the church is healthy. Um, I do my best to provide constructive um, criticism when I feel like I should. I spend more of my time uh, explaining why I love what I love and reinforcing the good things that I observe. Because if you spend more time criticizing than building up, your relationships deteriorate. That's true with the church and with your spouse and with anybody. Um, so for me, what it means to sustain the church doesn't mean to always agree with. What it means is the same thing I do with my wife. It means to love and to support and sometimes disagree constructively, but to ensure maybe as Joseph Smith described in section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants, that you follow up those disagree disagreements with an increase of love so that they know that you're not their enemy. And I think that when most of the time when people follow that strategy, it tends to perpetuate a healthy relationship. There's exceptions because relationships are messy. They can be messy at least. So, you know, your mileage might vary, but my mileage with that has been good. I, I have a good relationship with the church. I respect the leaders of the church. I support them. I want them to succeed. And sometimes we have some disagreements. I love that. I really love that. And I'm going to ask something that I hope is not offensive because you said that it you was... You can ask anything you want. I know. You said earlier that you're an open book. So let's hypothetically say that, you know, you have a child, you have a friend, you have somebody who's non-binary, they don't fit some type of uh, sexual orientation or gender norm. I'll make this not norm. even hypothetical for you. I've had this experience that you're Great. about to ask me about. Go ahead and <laughs> ask the question. Though. So the way that I'm thinking of it is you, you would define it. One day you would define your sustaining of it in the words that you just put but from somebody else who might not share that same perspective, they see Lincoln sitting in the pew, raising his hand to sustain the leaders. They see that as just the same as everybody else, every other Mormon, that your number as being somebody, a uh, participant in the Mormon church, feels like you don't love them, you don't sustain their gender identity or their sexual orientation because while you have a nuanced view of it, you're still counted with the larger membership. And that uh, feels like... You know, it feels like whatever it feels like to them, you know. It often can hurt them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so this isn't hypothetical Let me ask, talk this way, just so you're talking to the mic. Oh, sure. If, just I'm asking for the, for the too many good questions. So if I can just look this way, it's yeah. just for the camera and for, for the sure. mic. For so. sure, yeah, not a problem. Yeah, so this isn't hypothetical at all for me. I, um, in my experience in the church, I've lived in um, neighborhoods and wards with queer persons that are members of the church and others who are just in the word boundaries that weren't members of the church. And I, I've been their friend and I've had to deal with the tensions and the conflicts that have arisen on that subject over and over and over again. Right. I mean, we all can observe this. This isn't, this is no longer hidden. This is out there in the open as a, as a big challenge. And, um, one thing I would say is that I don't think that the general membership of the church is as monolithic as some suppose in their perspectives on this challenging issue. I think there's a lot of nuance and a lot of compassion on this topic, especially today, maybe less so a few decades ago um, when I was growing up, but I was also less mature and maybe couldn't see it when I was growing up. I don't know. I, I, I just remember it for what it was, but it feels like it's a lot more healthy. It's not healthy enough, but a lot more healthy than it was when I was growing up. So, you know, what do I say to them? Well, I, I do my best to be their friend and when on the, and I have specific occasions in mind, they have approached me and talked to me about membership in the church. I've asked them questions and given them feedback based on how they answer those questions. And, and on at least one occasion, I have told a queer friend that the church probably wasn't the healthiest place for that person to be, despite the fact that I love the church and I want that person to be a part of the church. Sometimes you have to end relationships, at least temporarily, for your well-being. 
And I think that eternity is big. It's long and it's big. And we have taken on ourselves the name of Christ. And part of the work that we've covenanted to do, all of us in the church, is to reconcile, to love each other and to reconcile. And I think that that can and will continue to happen better and better. It won't happen fast enough ever, never does, but it will happen better. And these people, these friends that um, have been separated from communion with us in the church, maybe th maybe they'll never return, but I trust that there will be times in the future when they could return in a more healthy way than they could today. Well, I could also just add that um, I see the process of sustaining as really aspirational. Like um, when I raise my hand to the square to sustain my leaders, I don't think that that is a statement that they are at all times speaking under inspiration and somehow sort of like dictation machines for God, right? Um, I instead think of them as profoundly human. In fact, I think uh, we're all, uh, uh, you know, all those who've been through the temple are uh, uh, the Lord's anointed. And so Christ's. I think, <clears throat> that's yes, what that means. Uh, yeah, Lord's we're anointed, anointed to become Christ. We are anointed as Christ. Um, Messiah literally means anointed one. Uh, and so I think that a lot of this stuff about sustaining one's leaders as well as um, the so-called evil speaking of the Lord's anointed is really, uh, it's these are terms about how we should, our orientation towards all saints. Um, and But specifically when I sustain my leaders, I am, uh, I am basically expressing aspiration that they do speak under inspiration that they do that they do become prophets seers and revelators but i don't claim that that always happens if that makes sense and i'm also agreeing to help them do that yeah absolutely that makes sense yeah i want to ask you about the compatibility of kind of a transhumanist mindset with with the mormon mindset but before we do i want to play a game Sure. Is that okay sure so i'm going to ask you to do something that's impossible but just don't take it too seriously okay, okay? okay. I'm going to ask you each to give your opinion as to the most common point of view for the transhumanists you know on various aspects of traditional Mormon doctrine or theology. So Mormon transhumanists. Yeah, Mormon okay. transhumanists. And I just want you to give a couple word answer, two, three words at the most. Should we possible. alternate? Yeah. Well, you're each going to give your opinion. So oh, I'll, okay. I'll give you an example. So anthrop like anthropomorphic god in the sky i'll do we'll do lincoln and then and then carl like what would be the average in your opinion the average mormon transhumanist view on that wow i sure Couple hope words. that god can manifest uh, morphologically in diverse ways with all of the super intelligence and nanobots going on okay wow that was confusing lincoln um <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's what came to mind <laughs> for god uh, the average mormon transhumanist view in your opinion I would just say that um, I think of God, and I think many transhumanists think of, think of God as not merely a single being. We already believe that we have heavenly parents, and naturally where parents are, there are children as well. And so I think, you know, in the grand scheme of things, God is really a community of exalted beings, um, and that these beings interact with their environment. Therefore, they must be they must have bodies. They must be able to interact with their environment. Okay. Um, now, as far as uh, whether or not they like have the same exact DNA lineage as we do here on planet Earth, I don't know. I mean, I think most uh, Mormon transhumanists would be somewhat agnostic about how literally, literally to take that. But I think even in our Mormon um, teachings, um, there are, that's open to various interpretations. Joseph Smith didn't even know about DNA. He didn't, you know, give any specifics on it. And I think a lot of this it enters into the realm of speculation, right? Yeah, oh, of course. There's also a question about what it even means to be anthropomorphic. Um, if, if you put a light cone or a possibility space cone in front of humanity right now, it still has limits based on who we are today the shape of our potential is a very human shaped potential. Even if someday biological humanity is no longer a category that rightly applies to us. So in a certain way, sure, we are and always will be anthropos, 
But in other ways, it's likely that evolution will take us beyond what most biologists would say is anthropos today. Okay. Next one. We're going to do just a couple of really quick ones. Next one is Jesus. <clears throat> what is Jesus to the average Mormon transhumanist? You go first, Carl. Few, few words as possible. That's okay. the game. <laughs> uh, Jesus is the Messiah, uh, the most um, prominent example of the example we should follow, of the, per uh, the role or the person that we should emulate and that we've covenanted to emulate. Okay. Jesus is the principal example of Christ, which name we've taken on ourselves. Okay. All right. Uh, Joseph Smith. What is Joseph Smith to the average Mormon transhumanist? Joseph Smith is a prophet, a fallible human who made lots of mistakes along the way, but an inspiring and an inspired prophet. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I'm not going to add a whole lot to that because I, okay, I generally agree. Yeah. I forgot to ask Holy Ghost. What do you think the average Mormon transhumanist would, how, how would they, what would they, how would they characterize the Holy Ghost? I want to let you go first. On go first on <laughs> this one's actually complex. We have a lot of interesting discussions about this. Um, I, I'm going to uh, average Mormon transhumanist. <laughs> I know it's a game. Oh it's man, just that's game. just so hard. I'm setting you guys up to all be pummeled, um, uh, but it's not intentional. It's I, just I'm, I'm just going to say that the Holy ghost is like, uh, is analogous to the father and the mother and the son and the daughter in the divine triune it's, and it symbolizes our pre-mortal origins. Wow. Okay. I wasn't expecting, I was expecting <laughs> Lincoln to say that the Holy Ghost was a sublime aesthetic. That I might have said. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've argued with each other so much that we have these like terms that we're, we've heard each other say. Uh, but um, I'm not very dogmatic about what the Holy Ghost is. Um, I prefer to just think of it as a source of inspiration. Um, but it's really hard to say what the average Mormon transhumanist thinks about it because <laughs> That's tough. Yeah, okay. like from one person to another, it changes all the time. So. I mean, we'll all agree that the Holy ghost is part of what Godhood is described as. We all agree on that now going beyond that. Okay. Book of Mormon, the book of Mormon, um, a, a work of scripture that is inspirational and there will be debates among Mormon transhumanists on the extent of its historicity. Yeah, same. Yep. Inspirational and inspired both. We, yeah, we, I think we have deep reverence for the Book of Mormon, but there are legitimate questions based on science about its historicity, and we, we discuss those questions. Yeah, I think that the anachronisms in the Book of Mormon clearly show that not all of it, at least, is, his, is historical. Um, and I would say that, but I, I think that, like most Mormon transhumanists, I agree that it has just as much right to be called scripture as any other foundational text of any other religion. Um, okay. Priesthood. Authority. But not necessarily power. DNC 121. Uh, yeah. I, I prefer to think of priesthood as authority. That as, you know, for example, like the, a license. the leaders of the church are the only ones authorized to make policy decisions on behalf of the entire church. And I'm perfectly okay with that. Um, where I think I sometimes struggle is where, or where I might disagree with someone is when they claim that the authority to preside over matters in the church really means that the prophet is like king of the entire earth. I don't really think of it quite the same way. Right. So sometimes people conflate um, that authority with, a different type of power, I guess. Okay. Uh, the, the current, uh, no, I'll say this, the idea of the LDS church being the one true church or the one and only true church. So the book of Mormon and the doctrine and covenants both present this idea in very abstract terms. Nephi says there's one church. That's the church of Christ. One church is the church of Satan, nothing in between, nothing else. The abstraction to which it's appealing doesn't lend itself, in my opinion, the scriptures would be incoherent if it was trying to describe particular institutions. So when we say that we're the true church, I, I interpret that as aspirational. We aspire to be that one true church when the kingdom of God on earth is subsumed into the kingdom of heaven. That's for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Joseph Smith said during the millennium, there'll be more than just Mormons. I agree with him. And, and I would add that, um, therefore, other denominations can belong to the church of Christ as well. 
And all of those who do the works of Christ, I would say, qualify as members of the Church of Christ. And so um, I personally feel that the way some members have thought of that, that claim, that we're the one true church, meaning this particular denomination is the only true church in the face of the earth, I, I disagree with that interpretation. Okay. And I think that's common, um, but not necessarily all Mormon transhumanists would agree with that. Okay, the modern LDS church prophet or president, what, what is that to the average Mormon? Who is that? What to the is average that? Mormon or average Mormon transhumanist? Aver to the average Mormon transhumanist, yeah. Yeah, so President Nelson is the president of the church. I sustain him as its leader, as it's currently organized. I think most, um, so 75%-ish of the members of the MTA are also members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I, I think that's a pretty typical perspective. Yeah, there's a leader. We sustain him as the leader. Um, now, we also sustain him as a prophet, but we should all be prophets per the scriptures. Okay, so prophet, the average kind of... Sounds like a, maybe a broader understanding of the term prophet than Oh, for sure. Mormon transhumanists Mormon. tend to think of prophet, prophethood as something democratic, that we should all aspire to be a part of. What do you of. mean? That we should all be prophets, like Moses says in yeah. the Old so, Testament. So, for example, when, Jesus, when Joseph Smith was asked by a journalist whether or not he was a prophet of God, he said yes, and so is anyone else with the testimony of Jesus, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Paul said we should be coveting to prophesy Moses when someone told on these other people in camp and said, hey, those so-and-so is prophesying over there, said, would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that he would place his spirit upon them. Um, the Book of Mormon even talks about Abinadi and Samuel as these dudes who came and um, prophesied that the people needed to repent, but they had no ecclesiastical authority whatsoever. And Jesus even came to them and said, hey, why aren't Samuel's words in here? And they're like, oops, I guess we forgot. Um, and, and so I think that the early Mormon conception of prophecy was much more radically egalitarian than many Mormons traditionally think of today. Um, but I think those roots of prophecy are, are one of our greatest hits, and we shouldn't you know, downplay that, the importance of that. What about non-Christians, the position or the status of non-Christians? <laughs> in... Yeah, so I, I love to quote DNC 2912, which says that the Lord will speak to all nations of the earth and they shall write it and the books will be, um, the world will be judged by the books that are written. I, I feel that if the Lord really is speaking to all nations of the earth, that has to mean more than just Christian prophets, right? And we also have some statements from other leaders of the church that indicate that other, other people throughout history have received inspiration besides just Christians. Yeah, we have members of the MTA who aren't Christian. Not a lot, but we have some, and they're welcome. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's do a, qu a few quick social issues. So same-sex marriage, the average Mormon transhumanist would would be, what would their position be about the legalization of same-sex marriage? Or can you even generalize? Um, there are some who have agreed with the, it's hard to say what the church's position is today, but because it's evolved but there's some who would agree with what it was historically that it shouldn't be legal. I would say the majority of Mormon transhumanists probably support legal same-sex marriage. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the you know the the church's history on race, whether it's dark skin being a curse based on wickedness for the Native Americans or Lamanites, or the priesthood ban that that wasn't lifted until 1978 on black uh, members of the church. Would there be some type of consensus there in your opinions? I think most will say it was racism, that we need yeah. to repent. We're mm -hmm. still working on it. Yeah, I, I agree as well. I think most um, are, uh, don't, are, are comfortable criticizing those views as not being of divine origin, right? Okay. And uh, the feelings around the, the judiciousness of, of women being able to hold the priesthood and kind of be equal to men in terms of uh, decision-making and, and those sorts of positions and authority? I do think that there, amongst those who've like talked and discussed about these concepts, there's somewhat of a difference of opinion on like how best to manifest more equality in the church. So for example, like some people see value in having some organizations that are only women and only men, like the idea of you know, does this mean we get rid of the Relief Society or the priesthood quorums and 
or is it more of like um, that we just need to provide them with a more equal status in the leadership decisions? And so the the nitty gritty of how it plays out and how it might be manifest uh, a more sort of a greater sense of equality. I think there's various views on how that might look, but I do think that there's a general agreement that some of the ways that we um, govern the church today and the ways that we manifest gender roles are not necessarily ideal. Yeah. What about uh, the, and this is going to lead to kind of one of my biggest questions for you guys today as we kind of start to uh, cl- come to a kind of a, a pinnacle or a climax of our discussion. Um, what about the perception to some that the church has not been always truthful with its, with its history, always transparent about its history? The church has not always valued science or intellectual inquiry or even criticism, and that the church has sort of uh, prohibited criticism uh had members vow to never speak quote ill of the Lord's anointed, which many interpret as not being critical. Um, you know, and this is kind of a a longer way of just saying like, uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to just kind of divert and then come right back to having you guys answer. Like what I perceive is that there's an intellectual rigor. There's an openness to honest discussion, to rigorous debate, to deep thinking, that I'm that I am now associating with transhumanism, and that I did before, which is why I had you guys on. But as as you two sit in front of me and you you sh- model how deeply you've thought about these issues, how much you care, how much language means to you, how robustly you've uh, thought of and even debated to arrive at what I would say are very sophisticated philosophies. Some would say, "Man, that how can that be compatible with Mormonism?" Like Mormonism. Some look at Mormonism as stifling debate, stifling critical thought, stifling open discourse and deep thinking. And I know you guys would probably reject that characterization, but some would just say, man, transhumanism is 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 not compatible with Mormonism because you guys care too much about truth and evidence and rigorous debate. And that's if Mormonism stands for anything, it's stifling open discussion. It's it's punishing people for criticizing. And, and asking for just blind obedience. Not, that's not fair, but if someone had that, is there a degree to which you or your community would see that, acknowledge it, and then how, how would you kind of mm-hmm. respond to that criticism or question? I would say that's a lot. Hear- Randy would get mad at me at a compound question. It's I just okay. asked you an impossibly compound question. No, I'm I hoping the gist of it. Okay, yeah. good. I yeah. hope you can sense the spirit of my question. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, and, people. Go ahead. Oh, I look forward to what Lincoln has to say about this as well. But I guess I would just say that um, there are different veins in Mormonism, and um, and like I said earlier, like I would acknowledge that perhaps some of the views that we share may not be the most predominant ones, but but I would absolutely defend that they're legitimate ones that even from our yeah authentic views of Mormonism, even from the earliest days of the church, there has been a vein in church amongst church thinkers about an openness to science, a confidence that the views that are being revealed to the prophets are compatible with science and also a willingness to even discard views or presuppositions that may in later in light of later evidence be contradicted. And so I think that uh, that while there are also dogmatic, authoritarian, maybe anti-science veins of thought in the church as well in our history, and sometimes it seems like some have had more, uh, you know, had the upper hand and and not others. Uh, I still think that we can clearly establish our approach amongst some of the great thinkers of church history. Um, and in fact, uh, Richard Bushman said he, he sees us as carrying on the tradition of like B.H. Roberts and um, Widso and Talmadge and others. So I, I, th- I definitely think that our views are authentically Mormon, but um, you know I totally agree with those who would say that the version of Mormonism they, um, they knew or saw or grew up with might be different from this. And what I'm trying to do is just like really promote what I think are our greatest hits and, and really try to 
of, you know, in, in many ways, fight against those who would try to characterize it differently. Now, I don't mean fight in sort of like a pugilistic way, but more just like resist the, uh, the, the notion that that's all that Mormonism ever was or could be. Yeah, I guess the first thing I would say is that that, that experience that you described and you, you acknowledged while you were describing it, it's not entirely fair. It's not, but it's real. People really, some people really have lived that perspective on Mormonism. And it makes me profoundly sad is the first thing. Uh, I, I wish it weren't the case. Uh, it's, not, it's not the Mormonism that I've experienced. It's not the Mormonism that I know some, many other Mormons have experienced. But nonetheless, that doesn't change the fact that some people have quite a few, apparently. And wouldn't you say you've experienced at least to the extent that some other members sometimes approach you and express these kinds of views? Yeah, although, I mean, I, in my experience, they're the minority, but some people mm -hmm. have experienced that that is what is generally going on. Yeah. I've never experienced that. Mm -hmm. but somebody has, and that's their life. And so I guess the first thing I have to do is say, damn, I'm sorry. I mean, we, that's the first thing we have to do is acknowledge that their experience is as real as mine. Um, from there, if they care, I'm happy to talk about why I love Mormonism, why I love the church, because I do genuinely, whole-souled. Now, again, that doesn't mean I always agree with all Mormons or with, you know, I don't always agree with anybody. Hardly ever even always agree with myself. But, but I, I love the church. I love our religion. I love what it has done on the whole. And I love even more what I perceive its potential to be. And I want everybody who's willing and able to participate in that with me. That's what I genuinely want. And so, you know, we, we've exerted a lot of effort, um, like, lots of members of the church do. This is not unique to Mormon transhumanists. Um, lots of Mormons exert effort to trying to share Mormonism. And, you know, lots of Mormon transhumanists do the same thing. We're, we're not exceptions to that. We, we love what we've got and we want to share it with people, but that doesn't mean we can't honestly recognize that it's, it has messed up in some cases, and in some cases terribly so. And, and I don't think that denying that that has happened serves any purpose. I think that's counterproductive. I think we need to acknowledge what people have lived and then say, remember though, that my experience is also real. And here's some things I've experienced and loved, and you might too. Yeah. In fact, I think that we almost need to um, promote, as I said, those kinds of interpretations that both um, are more expansive, that lead, lead forward, lead to a way forward. Um, rather than take the approach of we need, it needs to all burn, burn it all to the ground. There's nothing redeemable here. There's nothing of value here. Um, I think instead, um, both those who uh, are opposed to the church or who are frustrated by it, as well as those who love it and who support it, should be seeking to magnify the parts of it that are that we can agree are good, right? Rather than trying to sort of you know just. Burn it all down, I guess, if that makes sense. There's kind of a funny story that comes to my mind that I think epitomizes this tension. Um, in the early 1900s, the Quorum of the Twelve was divided on the question of pre-Adamites. Some thought, in accordance with the scientific evidence of their time, that pre-Adamites existed. Which is just humanoid. Humans are human-like species or animals Before or primates. Adam and Eve living but predating Adam and Eve. Yeah, predating what they might have dated Adam. Now, personally, I think that Adam is humanity, and I think that's the best reading of Genesis. That's not me imposing it back on it. I actually think that's the best reading of it. But putting that aside for a second, if Adam was a specific person, the question was, were there pre-Adamites? These, you know, and the Quorum of the Twelve itself was divided on this question, hugely divided. They debated it. There's records of this that you can get access to in, in various church libraries. And um, one of the people on the side of the existence of pre-Adamites was Talmadge, James Talmadge, the apostle. And I don't know whether he was saying this as tongue in cheek or whether this is a literal true thing that he did, but he says he went to Adam on Diamond and he checked the rocks that Adam used to build an altar. And he found fossils in them. <laughs> that was his, that was his argument in favor of pre-Adamites. Now, when you say the rocks, like, was that, like, is there some altar that's been attributed to Adam? 
Well, <laughs> it's like Zelf. So it's I, like, I was like, actually, Joseph's like, oh, that's the altar right there. I was actually at Adam on Nyoman just recently. I was picking oh, yeah. up one of my sons who served uh-huh. a mission in Missouri. And um, there are some things that are attributed. And, and, I, and of course, hmm. attributed is very different than, as we right, all know, right, than right, knowing right, right. for sure. Right. Um, but if you ever get a chance, just like almost, it's a little, it's a little tangential. If you ever get a chance, go to Adam on Diamond and find the preacher's rock. There's a rock overlooking a valley and you can whisper speaking from the rock and people a football field away from you down in the valley can hear you. Hmm. Oh, cool. So I, I gave the beginning of the King Follett sermon to my family from Preacher's Rock and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> What's the phenomenon there? Like, how does that work? Something about how the valley is Acoustics shaped. And... Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's really cool. Hmm. So go there. It's really hot in the summer though. Did you have a, did you have an, uh, uh I can't remember what the question was. That's fine. It's all right. Yeah. yeah. Well, a cousin question um, is like, if transhumanists are about progress, Mm -hmm. one of the criticisms of especially modern Mormon church leaders is that not only do they not see the future ahead of time, you know, that's what prophets, seers, revelators, it's all about like prophesying about the future seeing the future, revealing the future, prophet, seer, revelator. That's kind of like how we're all set up to think of our church leaders, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, the First Presidency. But a common critique of them is that not only do they not really ever see the future in any real meaningful way, but that that they actually have, in many instances, literally worked for the, as stumbling blocks to human progress, whether it's you know, fight, fighting the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, whether it's opposing the civil rights movement, whether it's fighting LGBTQ rights, whether it's fighting against science and sort of having an anti-science mentality that discourages a belief in evolution, that that devalues science, that, that seeks to demean scientists sometimes and elevate something else. And so I guess, you know, this is a different way of asking a similar question. And again, maybe you may object to that characterization, but it could, do trans, Mormon transhumanists ever find themselves frustrated that these prophets, seers, and revelators that they're supposed to sustain as being future-minded, are they, do, is it common for them to ever feel frustrated that these leaders are actually standing in the way of and retarding genuine human progress um, instead I'll, of instead of advancing it, yeah, I'll I'll respond, and I also want to hear Lincoln. But um, I I would say first of all that the notion of pro, a prophetic role is primarily one of like foretelling the future or predicting the future. I think is n- is both not the best way of thinking about it, as well as not genuinely or authentically the more Mormon way of thinking about it. I mean, while we do have some precedents for people who've claimed that some specific prophecies were like something Joseph saw in advance or whatever, I'd say for the most part, the uh, um, way of thinking about prophets that resonates with me most that I've heard often taught actually in church is of them as a type of forth teller, meaning um, that prophets actually preach what should happen. And then if the vision that the prophet is, is promoting is compelling enough, then people essentially have the choice of trying to realize that vision or not. And some of the most compelling prophecies about the future are self-fulfilling in the sense that um, a prophet might be so amazing and so compelling and charismatic in the way that they explain what the future is like that he might actually, he or she might inspire others to actually build that future rather than um, merely saying what's going to happen. It would be a weak form of prophecy to merely predict it, whereas it's more powerful to actually change the future, right? And the the most powerful prophets are those who change the future. Uh, So so I I take issue a bit with that characterization of what a prophet is. And then I would also say that, um, once again, there are different veins in Mormonism of those who've been anti-science and those who've been pro-science. And I personally like to think of the pro-science ones, the ones about discovering truth and embracing truth, as being the ones who are authentically Mormon and the ones who are fighting against the truth and the, and the discoveries of science, I would say are channeling. They were having bad days. Yeah. Unmormon influences. But I think, but I think most 
people, most students of Mormon history would say that the Talmages and the Irings and the Woodstows and the B.H. Robertses of our past basically died. Joseph Fielding Smith, who was more anti-science, outlived them and then incorporated into church curriculum and correlation, kind of a, a real anti-science mindset that has endured for maybe 40 or 50 years. And so uh, do you acknowledge yeah, that, I, I would that, definitely that say those that, guys kind of yeah, like in the same way lost that I've, a little bit, at least same, temporarily. In the same way I've said that if you want to say that my version of Mormonism is like less common, I would be willing to acknowledge that. I'd say also I probably that more pro-truth, pro-science um, approach is probably slightly less common in certain portions of our history. Um, but I definitely think that it's it's sort of there and it's not. It's also more, more coherent theologically. Mm -hmm. And I would say too that anyone who characterizes the um, approach of the current church as being entirely anti-science is also incorrect. I think uh, what we see is sort of a mixed bag there where we see several current contemporary statements of, of leaders of the church in favor of science. And we also see some statements that are kind of like somewhat uh, dismissive of science, right? So when Nelson, when President Nelson says something like a dog's always been a dog, or, you know, when he seems yeah. to really disparage Well, it's disparage funny because evolution. like President Nelson on the one hand has been uh, both a, a person who in his own field has advanced science in many ways, um, and who's been the beneficiary of incredible scientific innovations, um, at the same time, outside of his wheelhouse, has made some statements that are, like, I would say somewhat uh, dismissive of science, right? And so it's so uh, ironic and unfortunate that, you know, even in this, this single individual, we have examples on both sides of that argument, right? <laughs> yeah, although I think that that, I, I understand and recognize that really bugs some people. You guys weren't disappointed? No, I, 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 oh, mean, I'm kind I, of, I, I would I prefer kind of am. You were. I, yeah, I'm kind of disappointed, but go ahead. I would prefer that he not be dismissive of evolutionary science because evolutionary science is almost certainly true. But um, it, it doesn't disappoint me in, in, in any more of a sense as any other influential person in that area. Because yeah. for me, the role of prophet, which is different from the role of president, and he, he is in both roles, Neither of those roles has the responsibility of teaching me good science. That's just not his job. And I'm, and for me, I'm, I'm totally okay with that. You put him yeah, in a box. If I could put add, him in a box a little bit. I also want to add um, that like, well, like elaborate. Why, why is that a box for him? I mean, for, I, I esteem and revere him as the leader of the church, as the president of the church. And I sustain him as a prophet whose role is to forth tell the type of world that we describe in scripture, the positive side of it. Yeah. There's also some scary sides in scripture. Um, and, and that I think is his rightful role. And that's what I sustain him in. I don't sustain him in his scientific career. No, you're right. And, and I guess I'm channeling the 14 fundamentals of following the prophet where was it Benson or I don't even remember who wrote that talk, but it was like, the prophet is the authority on every single subject, no matter what, across well, all then I disagree with disciplines. That. And but I don't think even the church is advancing that point of view anymore. I yeah. think they've. I've heard some members say stuff like that, but for that's me, that's right. an eye roller. Like who, who, <laughs> who could possibly live that way? None of us. I can't do that. Yeah. Well, why should I expect somebody else to do yeah. that? Yeah, I would just add too that like one thing that's been profoundly Im important and um, beneficial for me from an emotional perspective with all this stuff is to actually just like dramatically lower my expectations of my fellow humans. Um, so taking a stoic approach to both church and to life in general and expecting to be disappointed by my fellow human beings most of the time has been hugely <laughs> helpful for me to like be sane yeah. Um, I used to have very, uh, I would say, unrealistic expectations of my church leaders. And of yourself. And of myself <laughs> and of my wife and lots of other people. <laughs> and when I, I find that when I expect to be disappointed, then I'm pleasantly surprised when th things turn out better than that. And so... Who knew this would turn into a therapy session for Carl? <laughs> <laughs> so that's been part of why, how I cope with some of these frustrating statements occasionally, right? Nice. Um, I have a question. Um, 
So I think you've accurately explained, I mean, not accurately, I think that you have nicely summarized why your faith in the Mormon church uh, works together with your transhumanist beliefs. My frustration, though, is still, I want you to kind of address the idea of how can somebody be a Mormon and a transhumanist? Why can't you just have those ideals, but not actually participate in the church? What is the actual participation in the church? What you could have your ideas around it, but I, we talk a lot about systemic abuse in this church, taking your kids to a place where we know that the church could possibly cover up a sex abuse, something, and you, you never know what the church's priorities are. And it's usually not your child. And so I have a children's rights first perspective always. And so how does somebody who wants to say, you know, be stay Mormon. They like the they like the theology that you just mentioned. They like your transhumanism, but they don't want to actually participate in the church. Do you have people like that in your organization that that just can't remedy actually attending church because there's just too much systemic problems that they don't want to subject their children to? Yeah, I mean, not all of our members are active in at, at church, but they carry the ideas. Um, yeah, several in of similar them ways? continue okay. to find uh, resonating ideas um, in in Mormon transhumanism. Maybe they define Mormon more broadly than a church member. Yeah, I would say. Like Lincoln said earlier, still the majority of our members are active in in church. Um, the you know, it, I guess it, but th- th- there is a significant contingent of those who are either less active or some who are even never Mormon or some who used to be Mormon. Um, and I think I totally uh, like Lincoln said earlier as well. Uh, support someone who, for because of their specific family situation, um, have decided that the pros don't outweigh the cons, right? And that they need to step away. But I, I also personally feel like the many opportunities that church service gives me to engage in uh, in activities where I'm like, I'm put in touch with other people who maybe think differently from myself, who can help me to develop certain um, qualities, Christ-like qualities that I try to aspire to. Uh, that those those opportunities are good. I recognize, though, that everybody has a different vantage point and a different sit- life situation, and so it's not going to necessarily work for everyone. But um, I find that many of the covenants that I've made and sort of the commitments I've made in a church context do continue to help me, and I try to magnify the parts of church that I really that really resonate with me. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Yeah, very similarly. You know, there are people who have had terrible experiences whose children to your point have had terrible experiences in the church. My, my perception is that that is the minority that doesn't make those, um, experiences less serious than they are, that they remain very serious. I've raised my children in the church. They're now all adults. Well, my youngest will be an adult in like a couple of months. And, um, they've had some challenges along the way as we all do, but By far, it's been a positive experience for them so far as I can tell. And, you know, some of that we tease out as we mature and we look back on our experience and decide what to make of it. So maybe, maybe they'll interpret that differently over time. We'll see that they're their own people. I look back at my childhood in the church. I had some negative experiences, but again, I, um, for me, it was by far overall a positive thing. And, um, so I, while I, I, I don't I don't want to pretend because it wouldn't be true that there aren't seriously negative experiences that some people have themselves and their children in the church. I think it's equally true to say that some of us have excellent experiences um, for ourselves and our children. And I and in my and I don't know how to quantify it, but my perception is that it's more far more on the positive than the negative. Um, and so I, I I I wouldn't hesitate for a moment to advocate to people that they should consider joining the church. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the church. I think it, on the whole, can improve many people's lives. Um, are there exceptions, important exceptions to that? Yeah, and I'll acknowledge those. But I, I mean, the missionary spirit is still burning alive and well in, in me. And this is a tough question, and I'm not trying to hijack you with it or, like, do a gotcha question. But, sure. like, what if someone were to say to you, yeah, you had a great experience in the church because you presumably are a white, straight you know, pioneer legacy, heterosexual, cisgender, Mormon of man of privilege. And it's privilege alone because the church was made by you metaphorically for you metaphorically. So of course you had a good experience. So, so, you know, 
can you acknowledge or do you acknowledge that maybe your positive experience is at least in part a function of your privilege? Not even maybe, for sure it is. Okay. And then the second part of that question is if somebody were to say to you, yeah, but by by supporting this institution that many of you might be racist, sexist, homophobic, cisphobic, you know, gender, transphobic, whatever, you're basically uh, aiding and abetting or financially supporting an institution. Yeah. You're, that's you're, true of all You're enabling an institution that's causing a lot of harm to the people that don't have the same privilege you have. You're kind of perpetuating yeah. the harm. What, what do you say to that? Yeah, my answer to that is that's true of all institutions, all organizations, all groups. They all have their... They'll have their norms, their mm. bigotries, their biases. And what I aspire to is Christian discipleship, which does transcend those things without making any of them unimportant. The body of Christ is not all one big eye. It's got hands and feet and legs, and they're all different. They're diverse. This is the metaphor that Paul uses in the scriptures. And I love that but it's also united. So it's a unity of differences working together for some common purpose, which I trust is the immortality and eternal life of humanity. And, and so, um, you know, yeah, there, there, are, there are real challenges in every organization. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is no exception. Yes, I have benefited from some of those because I am a straight white male. For sure, that has benefited me repeatedly. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. Do I want it to be better for people who have been treated unfairly because of that? Absolutely. And I think that we have made progress there and we still have more progress to make there. And I, and I think wallowing in, in, in the fact that we've made mistakes and focusing only on that without turning around and saying, and we can and will do better, it would be a mistake. We can and we will do better. And so let's do it. Yeah, I I think that um, I want to acknowledge that many people, like in a situation similar to mine, have come to different conclusions, um, and so I don't at all deny that there are those who've ex who've whose experience and whose calculus of the pros and cons has come to a different conclusion. Um, I do still feel like there's a lot of good out there that the church does, and I continue to want to support and magnify that good, and I also know that. There are many people um, out in the world who, for whom the church and the, the participation in the church is like a profound step up from what they are currently experiencing. And I just want to try to make that better and try to eliminate those negative uh, aspects that we've talked about, right? Um, but, I, but I wouldn't presume to claim that my experience applies to everybody out there. Beautiful. All right. Well, I uh, I want to keep talking to you guys, but I'm uh, I, for today. I think I'm I'm in, we're going to need to kind of wrap up here. But I hope to have you back. I, I I really enjoyed today. I really love your perspectives. Yeah, and I want to hear people's comments and things. And if we have them back, I'd love to have like a part two. Yeah. and integrate more comments of what people's questions were because I'm just popping off the top of my head everything that comes to my mind. So I'm sure the listeners have a lot of yeah. stuff that they want to have follow up yeah. questions too. So I I hope we can do that. But I do want to kind of get you out on this. Let's just say we were going to make a TikTok or an Instagram or a short video on each of you kind of explain. What I want to do is end by each of you explaining how Mormon transhumanism has really helped you. In other words, the whole thrive idea is, you know, let's help people heal and grow. However, you know, whatever we can do to provide people with opportunities to heal and grow in or out of the church, we just want people to find healing and growth. And so if you were to answer the question, of how Mormon transhumanism has materially enhanced your life. I would love to hear each of you just kind of give your elevator pitch so that if somebody is looking for a philosophy, looking for a community, looking to salvage their participation in the church and or faith in the church, looking for a reason to exist. Looking for a reason to get out of bed. That's what Carl mentioned at the beginning, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, Give yeah. a, give kind of your elevator pitch for how Mormon transhumanism has been an important part of that. And I'll just throw that meat out there and let you guys fight over who gets a first bite. At okay, the meat. I'll go for it. All Mormon right. transhumanism has helped me to make sense and apply my faith more meaningfully in the here and now and to be inspired to try to change the world that I currently live in rather than merely expecting or waiting for something better in the afterlife. Nice. 
Again, that's kind of Buddhist, living in the now. Yeah. Um, Mormon transhumanism has infused me with a, with a confidence that we are working on something sublime that we that humanity together is working on something sublime, something transformative that we have potential that equals and surpasses our imagination. And that all of the technologies that we have available to us, including religion, which is a social technology, can contribute to our sublime destiny. Let's call it destiny, even if it's um, a destiny we have to work for and has a lot of risks along the way. Mormon transhumanism has made that real and substantial for me, not, not just kind of a, a pacifier to help me deal with the challenges of life, but it's actually motivated me and made it made it tangible and real for me in my life. I love it. Well, there's so much more we could talk about. We really didn't even get into technologies and and that sort of thing, but we brushed on them. So that's all beautiful. You guys are smart and inspiring, and I I want there to be more Mormon transhumanists, honestly. So I have to ask, why the freak isn't there a Mormon or is there a Mormon transhumanism podcast? Because we, you guys could yes. should be bigger. I would like to see, like when I met with Elder Holland once, he met. I met with uh, him and my brother Joel, and he literally ended the meeting by saying, "I wish there were a hundred thousand Joel and John Delins in this church." You know what I mean? And I'm going to say the same thing to you guys. I wish that there were five million Mormon transhumanists, because if if all Mormons were kind of like seeing things the way you see it. I think that would be good for the Mormon church. I think that would be good for humanity. I think that could improve a lot of people's lives. So why the freak are you guys better marketers? Why don't you have a <laughs> podcast and a YouTube channel? Why are there only a few hundred or thousand of you? Come on guys. Yeah. yeah. You need we some need, help. Do you want, do you want to hire me to consult you guys? Like totally. Yeah. What's your rate? What's there should be at least 50,000 <laughs> uh, subscribers to a Mormon transhumanism YouTube channel. Come on we, dudes. We actually have been talking about this and, uh, sort of, um, we've been through a couple of leadership changes in the last few years, and I'm now the president of the association and working very tirelessly to try to try to move things forward. Um, so we are planning a podcast. Don't know exactly when that's going to start. All right. But one of the big things that I'm working on right now is this upcoming conference, right, in March, on March 19th. That's going to be okay. awesome, amazing. Is this your first conference? Well, I've as helped to organize many conferences, but the first one is president. Nice. Yes. His yeah. primary role, though, back in the day, was organizing the conferences. So he's done this many times. But, but the Carl the Carl Youngblood administration begins. There you go. Yes, yes, right? exactly. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> a, new, so a new sheriff's in town, everybody. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I really do think, though, that this has some breakout appeal. So I really one more plug. I think I love it's it. Worth, it's worth coming out to. Kara, what do you think? Do you think, are you a little, are you like at least intrigued or impressed or inspired by their this brand of Mormonism at all? Yeah, obviously. I'm, I'm putting like, you on the spot because you yeah. can say no, I think it's lame, but. No, absolutely. I think to echo what you just said, that if more Mormons thought this way um, and had more of an expansive view of Mormon, I'm, I'm the most anti-dogma person ever and it sounds like you guys are too. I'm <laughs> so, there with you. Yeah. So anyone who is against this kind of like dogmatic view of Mormonism and there's one way or the highway kind of view. It's a huge improvement. And I think you guys are very intelligent and very empathetic. And I love, um, Lincoln, when you started off by talking about ethics and that you're viewing things through an ethical framework, first and foremost with your transhumanism. Um, I don't think you can really like go a lot of wrong in that. Does that make sense? Like, I think you've, you've started with a framework that I really agree with on so many, on so many ways in so many areas. So everything you said today really resonated and is a really beautiful way. I don't, I personally don't, I can't get, I can't come to grips with believing in a higher power. I can't get there, but I see so much beauty and utility in it. And that's what I see in what you guys said today, like a beauty and utility. I was there with you too at one point in my life. That's, yeah. I, I, I feel that. Gotcha. Yeah. And we don't have more time, enough time, but I should mention that Lincoln has developed something he calls the new God argument. It sort of like argues in a probabilistic way for why, what the ramifications of not believing in a in God are, and sort of like that it may mean that humanity is sort of doomed to extinction. So I'll just leave a like a kind of like a, a teaser for that. 
It's a foot in the door for part two yeah. or yeah. part yeah. three. Yeah, it's a just a hanger. popular <laughs> argument among religious transhumanists for, for faith in God. Okay, last question. Uh, can you, because we're going to do a part two. So just three. it's, it's going to happen. Sorry, three, whatever. <laughs> Good, let's do it. The, the first interview that's going to be in the show notes uh, sure. with Carl. This is part two. Part three. What would you like to leave the audience with? You already mentioned some websites. Are there books, philosophers, articles, other websites that you want the audience to check out if they're interested? Yeah, so plug to the MTA website, of course, first of all. So um, the domain name is? Transfigurism.org. Okay, that's confusing. Yeah, yeah, there's a story, there's <laughs> a story sure behind that too. But you can just Google Mormon Transhumanist Association, yeah. it'll pop right up. Okay. Right. Um, I, I have a blog I've been blogging about um, technological evolution and post-secular religion for 15 years at lincoln.metacanon.net. Post-secular religion. We just got, we just got like leapfrogged, Kara. Like we thought secularism was kind of like, I'm kidding, but like <laughs> some think secularism is the culmination and they just posted us. <laughs> they now have established post-secular religion. Did you know that there's a life after your life right now, Kara? Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> They envision a life beyond your You know state. the week that we had? You know my brain cells are like barely hanging on right now? So well, just Link to have this like, discussion Link, and Link follow just it. Did, Link just was like, I was like you once, Kara. <laughs> and I've evolved. No, He's no, just I out feel evolved. it. I, wanted, just, I, I wanted you to hear that I'm fe I feel that. I know what yeah. you're talking about. I'm kidding. Yep, 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 yep. Totally. <laughs> I'm teasy. Sorry, I just derailed you. Okay, Keep say going. the website, your blog one more time. Lincoln dot metacanon dot net. Or you can just type in Lincoln Canon. I'm good at search engine optimization. I'll be right at the top. Um, <laughs> And then, like, if you want to read some cool... Our YouTube channel is a good... Our YouTube to... channel is excellent, which is also youtube.com YouTube slash transfigurism or just Mormon Transhumanist YouTube. Really excellent. We have all of our conference speakers going all the way back to 2012 there, including Richard Bushman, Terrell Givens, um, all the others that we already talked about. Um, Adam Miller, Rosalind Welch. That's right. Yeah. We, we've had great Mormon speakers and we've had equally great transhumanist, secular transhumanist speakers. These are people who many of whom are atheists who have come to our conferences and presented. We've had them talk with other Mormons, other celebrity Mormons, and like have panels together where they chatted back. Interesting stuff. Have you had celebrity ex-Mormons yet? That's the question. I'm just uh, kidding. Do you want to be on? <laughs> I'd come. <laughs> Which, I don't know that you, you want You just got me. an offer. <laughs> John, we want everybody. Seriously. We have, we have. I don't think you do. No, seriously. We invited, we invited um, a fundamentalist Christian to come offer a criticism of Mormon transhumanism. <laughs> We have invited secular atheists to come publicly with the with our with our blessing blessing. We paid for their we paid for their ticket to fly from the United Kingdom to Utah to deliver a criticism of Mormon transhumanism. So maybe Mormon Voldemort will, will appear. <laughs> there you go. Is that what you think of yourself as? That's, no, Do you have I'm, Horcruxes as well? <laughs> I mean, we're just being playful. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. Please do come. That okay. would be great. You'll have to talk to him. He's in charge of that okay, these yeah. days. I don't want to stain your, your <clears throat> new tenure. Let's wait until your your tenure is soured a little bit. But please go to mtaconf.org <laughs> and like I said, actually even if you're not even if you're not you don't think of yourself as that religious of a person, I think many interesting and important technologies will be being discussed at this conference. And so I think you'll find something there that is actually It's quite in person. Insightful. Give yes. us the dates and the location. March and... 19th, Provo City Library. Okay. Uh, in the ball. Is that where there. the Sorry for Women conference was held? It got moved. It was oh, okay. at the Provo okay. Library, but okay. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. March 19th, Provo Library. Is there a um, price, a registration fee? Yeah. It's fairly modest. There's options for those who are students or um, indigent circumstances. And MS Friend, all caps, all one word, is your um, promo code for 20% off. But like I said, we're not breaking even on the conference. We it, It's through we do the donations of our members. Yeah. That it, that's made possible. Um, but it, this year it's going to be really exciting. We have some really top tier talent that's coming in um, to speak. So, and name yeah. some of the people or. Yeah, Laura Shin is like the most uh, prominent podcast host in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. So, Aaron may want to um, come to this. Curve. So, she she's going to come talk. Um, and then we have a Mormon keynote speaker who's also really prominent in the blockchain space and as a public speaker. Uh, sort of in the public sector. He's advised many like White House administrations and is, is really well known and now is kind of promoting Web3 blockchain technology. Then we have like some really interesting stuff around like charter cities, um, people who are looking into new forms of governance. So like 
special economic zones, uh, international development, and all sorts of like ways that decentralization might change the fu- the the arrangement of countries and things in the future, basically. So pretty cool stuff. All right, I'll be speaking on the decentralization of God. Nice blockchain God. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I'm I'm actually anxious to hear what, the, what that's all about. <laughs> Cool, guys. I yeah. love it. All right. Well, this is uh, so, oh, really quickly. So, Carl, put you on the spot. Bitcoin, buy or sell? Or don't don't get involved. Which one? <laughs> um, Three answers. All well, one word. This is, buy, not financial, sell, or... this is not financial <laughs> okay. advice, but I do think that investing in solid corner, kind of blue chip, uh, what I call blue chip cryptos as part of your portfolio strategy is is a wise thing to do. So Bitcoin, buy, sell, or don't get involved. Bye. We won't hold you on this. No one hold him to this. Right. This is just a game. This buy is at least fun. some. Buy at least some. Buy some. Ethereum, buy, sell. <laughs> better or buy. Better what? buy. Better buy than Bitcoin. Better buy? Yeah. Okay. And then each of your recommendation for the best best cryptocurrency to buy right now for the biggest Ooh. return, safest, <clears throat> but biggest return. Oh, I have no. Uh, I don't feel safe in recommending any individual. Do you? <laughs> you did to me privately. <laughs> did I? What did I say? Oh, it's okay. I, I, and I'm not. <laughs> I actually don't that. remember. I don't remember what I said. But anyway, so Solana is it Solana kind of? I popular? don't. Well, I I did mention them as one option, but yeah. I don't think I would. Uh, like There's a handful exclusively put them out as the the biggest one. Handful of what I would say are nothing in crypto safe in the. I mean, it's super volatile, but the safest biggest returns. Blue chips. What are the blue chips? Avalanche, Phantom, Solana, Cardano. Those aren't blue chips, though, right? Those yes, are those whatever. Are that's what you're, that's after, what you're saying. E- that are that are oh, like okay. I was highest gonna used. Say, I was going to say Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think of oh as yeah, blue chips. You okay, know. And yeah, then the, for sure. You, those, your those list of like secondary would be what? Yeah, like some of these these next generation ones, like Avalanche, Solana. Uh, I don't. I hate Cardano. I don't really feel Phantom, but Phantom. Yeah, um, Phantom's total value locked has exploded. Polka dot probably. Yeah. What about Wait. Dogecoin? Come on, guys. N- I'm not uh, so it's much into mean. It's kind of like, yeah. if you see value there, have fun. <laughs> I lost like 750 bucks on Dogecoin so far. Oh, what man. did I buy? What did no, I that buy wasn't Dogecoin? so bad, right? But like the technical future, <laughs> the technical future of blockchain technologies, like the real meaty potential is being manifest in these other ones that we just talked about. There, there's like, not all of them will succeed, but if some of these that we just mentioned succeed, it's, it's, it's paradigm shifting stuff for the world of finance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say beyond that, really quick, just since I'm in this field, what I think these are going to do is enable um, new forms of governance in both the way corporations are structured, the way uh, organizations like Mormon Stories or our Transhumanist Association are structured, um, also in the ways that people organize themselves, new organizations that don't even exist yet, new ways of forming bonds between people that are more sort of egalitarian. For example... You could create social media like Facebook or uh, Twitter um, that did not have a middleman in in it, not, no Facebook, no Twitter behind them, but that function in similar ways, right? So uh, the promise is that communities and individuals will be more empowered to build systems that really add value rather than trying to extract the value in other ways. If I had to so. summarize this entire podcast, diversify your portfolio – Money wise and also theology wise. Ooh, yeah, I like hey, it. That's a kind of diversify your mental portfolio. Like that's a great summary. Thanks. I like that. I'll put that in the description. But I will be writing after this. <laughs> She'll be making a TikTok of herself being wise and sharing that. As well. Yeah. Right. John, you've cornered me. <laughs> I'm just all about myself, and I have, and I'm just waiting for them to say something so I can sneak in. No, 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 no. never. I enjoyed this, and you guys were just naming off. My husband's really into trading that stuff all day. It was like you were naming off like all of his mistresses that he has to go off to the bedroom <laughs> to tend to. She's like at home and at work, we have to talk about this anyway. It's true. We do everyone diversify your portfolios. And I don't want to give the impression that our conference is just for crypto bros. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> like seriously, it's going to be so glad you qualified that. <laughs> There's going to be a wide variety of interesting topics. Um, yeah. So. All right. I'm interested. Thank yeah. You. Okay, so uh, we'll include a link to the conference in the show notes. The 
Promo code, if you're going to register, is... MS Friend. All MS words, all Friend. Count. And uh, check out the Mormon Transhumanist Association or whatever it's called. These are great guys. Bunch of cool people. And there's women, too. There are. Not <laughs> enough, unfortunately. There's, there are demographic challenges in transhumanism like there are in Mormonism. Yeah. And we have the overlap of those challenges, unfortunately. But yes, our vice president, Connie Packer, is one of those women, and there are several others. Our last two CEOs have been women as well. Um, and I'm just trying Bla to— Blair Osler is yeah. very well respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's she, a she's a. That's right. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Well, gentlemen, thanks for coming. Come again. I Thank respect you. you a lot, and I hope to build on this friendship, and I want to see— a Mormon transhumanism podcast before, you know, thanks for the inspiration. We I really need to do this. Um, no, really. You can yeah. help a lot of people. I really believe your positions are compelling and you could help a lot of people. Yeah. Thank you. And sometimes Mormon apologetics just looks like any old harebrained excuse to try and get people to stay. You guys seem to have sincere reasons to cling to, or to grow Embrace and to whatever. enhance and to cultivate your faith. So it's not just some, it doesn't feel to me as just some reaction as a defense to hold on to something you don't want to let go. It it feels like there's actually some fertile ground of like revitalizing your faith and and growing it because of what you've learned from transhumanism. And I like that a lot better than just like we can't let this go. I don't want to let this go. It's like, hey, there's value here. Yeah, thank you. And we want to foster these kind of friendships across different ide ide ideological lines, right? So um, these kind of discussions that we're having today, even with folks who might find themselves slightly in a different position, are what we thrive on, and we want to promote those bridges, right? So thanks yeah. for having us. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you, John. Thanks, Kara. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, Kara. Thank fun. you, Kara. And thanks to all our listeners who uh, support us. We couldn't do this without you. We're so grateful for all the people that have stepped up to donate to Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation uh, and we couldn't do it. So if you want to join, uh, those who are supporting us that make Kara her, her possible Gerardo, Jen, Jennifer, uh, just all the amazing work of Mormon stories and the open stories foundation. If you value this work, if you want to see it continue, please become a monthly donor at Mormon stories, uh, org. Send us your feedback at Mormon stories at gmail.com. Subscribe to us on uh TikTok at Mormon stories, podcast, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. We love your follows. We love your subscriptions. We love your positive reviews. Please share this with everyone. Comment and give us your feedback. And if you've got other ideas of great topics we can cover, if you want to bring these gentlemen back, maybe some other women um, or gender non-binary, uh, trans Mormon transhumanists, if you want to uh, give us your best ideas or talk about other possible show opportunities, you can email us at Mormon Stories at gmail.com and, and give us your feedback. But thanks for the support. Please continue the support. And we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody.